Hello survivors and welcome to First Aid Spray, a Resident Evil podcast by fans for fans. This is episode 29 and in this edition we do battle against one of Umbrella's founding families in our look back at Resident Evil Code Veronica. My name is Cyniac, you can just call me Cy and joining me on the panel this week, when he can't find a loved one he too finds himself infiltrating European buildings and being thrown in jail cells on tiny islands. It's fire button Steve Valance. Hello. Forgetting his door key was taped to the bottom of a small vase, he's recording this edition of the podcast from, as Alexia might say, the corridor. It's Moist Owlet, aka James. Sorry. <laughs> Sitting not on a pile of magnum rounds, so much as magnum rounds, explosive arrows, flame rounds, acid rounds, 150% assault rifle ammo, fully loaded submachine guns, need I go on? It's explosive A himself, boy wonder, Adam Russell Reeves. I do have so much ammo. He previously mentioned he had some serious opinions about Code Veronica, but then he was knocked out, and the next thing he knew, he woke up on this crazy podcast from Steamforge Games. It's show in Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> Feel the hype. Feel the hype. I'm excited about this one. This episode of the podcast, like all others, was recorded live in our Discord server. Join now to hear the podcast early and unedited, as well as engage with our community, contribute to the show and other upcoming projects, and be informed first of everything going on behind the scenes. You can find a link to the server in the description of the podcast or on our social media accounts. You can also support the show on Patreon for as little as $1 a month with various tiers, each with their own perks. Check out patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod for a full list and the chance to create bonus first aid spray content. Uh, so, a little bit of housekeeping at the top. Very, very basic. As always, just want to plug the new videos. The latest from us is the History of Stars Law video, as read by uh, Jordan and as edited by Mr. KDB. That one was very cool, very different. Um, very different looking video for us. It uses a lot of, like, stock footage in very clever ways. So I, I highly recommend that one. And um, I don't know if I should plug this or not yet because it's not out. But Steve and I recently recorded an episode of the Crimson Head Elder podcast. We are guests on their special Resident Evil Wars, where each member of the panel is pitting uh, a game of their choosing against each other in various categories. And Steve and I get to play judge. It was a lot of fun to record, and hopefully you guys will be able to hear that very, very soon. So if you're not subscribed to those guys, and you absolutely should be, go do that now and look out for that. Uh, other than that, that's about it. Time to roll into... Every time we do an episode, I'm like, oh, it's a huge edition of the news. But yet again, we've got more chatter about the various goings-on in terms of Resident Evil on your TV screen. So uh, take it away, Steve. All right then, kids. So our first bit of news then, there are the first... I think it's cast details for the new live-action Resident Evil film directed by Johannes Robson, uh, Johannes Roberts, and they have been announced. Yes, <laughs> they have been. They have been announced. Uh, yeah, a little bit of plot detail, I suppose, but I guess we'll talk about the cast more than anything. That's that's the major thing. This is the. This is kind of like the first sort of like rock in the pool, isn't it? This is this is starting to get real now with with the cast, and it's it's. I mean, it's it's a pretty strong cast. Like, it, they're fairly well-known actors and actresses. I'll take you quickly through the six characters um, and, and who's playing them that we know. So um, I hope I pronounce any, all of these correctly. Kaya uh, Scodelero is playing Claire Redfield. Um, you may know her from Skins, and she's in Maze Runner as well. Um, you have uh, Hannah John Carmen, I think that is, who is in Ant-Man of the Wasp as Jill Valentine. Robbie Amell, who's in uh, Amazon Prime's Upload. I think he was in Pretty Little Liars as well. He's playing Chris Redfield. Tom Hopper, who's in the Umbrella Academy, is the the, the massive giant square dude. Uh, who ironically kind of looks like Chris from Village. Uh, but he's playing Wesker. Um, <laughs> Avian, or sorry, Avan Yogia, I think that's correct, from Zombieland. Double Tap is playing Leon S. Kennedy. And Neil McDonough from... Uh, Yellowstone and lots of other things as well is cast as William Birkin so that is a a big net of characters you know the four pillars of Resident Evil as we like to say and the major antagonist and also Birkin who is arguably one of the most important antagonists um, Steve what was your first reaction to to this cast? Honestly one of these people who doesn't watch that much TV uh, I, uh, I recognise two of the actors which are Neil McDonough and Kaya Scodelero. Uh, Kaya because, obviously, Effie Stoneham, and Mr. McDonough because he was the red shirt in First Contact, Star Trek First Contact. That's that's literally it. Oh, yeah, Unfortunately, is, yeah. I, 
uh, I, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll be good. Uh, I, I, by that I mean that they seem like strong casting choices. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I can see where they're going. It just doesn't necessarily need to need more plot details first. You know, right? You're, I mean, yeah. There's only so much speculation you can do about names. It's all about seeing the performance, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I just don't know these actors well enough. <laughs> no, I totally, I totally get you. I'm familiar with. Most of them, I would say. I, um, I know James as well. Um, recently watched Upload. I can very much see uh, Robbie Amell as Chris Redfield. He's probably the strongest pick for me out of the lot. It's very difficult to separate uh, Effie Stoneham <laughs> from the actress for me and think about her as Claire Redfield. So that's going to be a bit of a tricky one. Um, James, how do you feel about the casting? Uh, yeah, I think it's really, as you say, I think I think it's really strong. I love, uh, I love, as you say, Robbie Amell as Chris Redfield. I think that's really, really great also watching season two of umbrella umbrella academy Mm -hmm. i'm not going to spoil it for you guys right so don't you know don't have to but i can definitely see tom hopper as albert wesker after seeing season two interesting right it's like i really i'm really really gonna enjoy watching him uh be a bad guy right or like someone who is just you know just that way inclined it's going to be so interesting to watch him who's te- stereotypically a nice guy when you see him on the screen he's he's kind of a good guy uh neil madonna like i'm re- dono i'm really excited to see him um yeah kaya uh, scodelario uh, again really excited to see her on the screen the last thing i seen her in was crawl which is a actually kind of good movie even though it sounds awful um it's just mm-hmm. about a crocodile is a crocodile disaster movie um <laughs> monster movie sorry um yeah but the rest of the cast i don't really know but equally excited like i'm i'm very excited about this cast um uh, oh yeah like neil madonna is william birkin i was, I was gonna say like i looked at him i was like yeah yeah <laughs> that, that that's cool i like it I like it a lot. Are we just talking about the cast, or can we talk we'll, about? We'll stuff talk about the plot. Well, yeah, we'll talk about sort of the plot afterwards. It's just let's, let's sure. just get a little bit of thoughts on the cast. Um, yeah, with, with Kaya, Kaya Scalaro, it's I've not really seen her in anything other than Skins, so I don't. I'm sure she's played American characters or whatever. So I, maybe I need to to dip in, and that that'll help. I yeah, that maybe that's what it is. Um, I've not seen Umbrella Academy. I was, everyone keeps telling me to watch The Boys. I feel like that's probably next. But now, because of this, I feel like I have to watch Umbrella Academy to sort of <laughs> get, get an idea of this. And, 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 you know, same same with some of the other. I mean, I've not seen the Ant-Man, either of the Ant-Man films. I've not seen Zombieland 2 yet. Um, easy enough to knock them off, I suppose, if you, if you wanted an insight into those actors. But, you know, they're, they're decent named, like, decent sized films. These aren't nobodies, at least. Uh, Adam, what do you think? Um, Tentatively excited. Mm-hmm. I like a lot of these actors, you know. Um, Umbrella Academy was excellent. I, I watched, I devoured all of that um, as as they came out. So I'm very excited to see what Tom does for Wesker. Um, I love Neil McDonough. He's uh, he's he's done a lot of like he's just what he to me he feels like one of those kind of cult actors. Yeah, for sure. That people are you know that people root for. He was uh he was in I think it was Arrow. Yeah, Arrow, which is a is a horrible series. Um, <laughs> but but he played a good great character in that. Yeah, he played like a really good, like horrible villain, like right. really hammy. Yes. So that was exactly. just a lot of fun to watch. My my only issue is I feel like it's he's he's you know, he's not a young guy and Birkin was never an like an older man, so mm. Uh, it will be interesting to see what they do with that. My biggest issue, I guess, actually with the casting, I don't really have any issues when we talk about the plot. I might, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm tentatively excited at that. There's they're they're people that can act um, from mm. what I've seen of them. So unless they're just horribly directed, which is always a chance, you know, um, I don't yeah. I don't have any I don't have as many worries as I did. Well, I do have plot worries though. We'll get to that. Uh, show in any thoughts on the cast? Um, to be honest, not so much. I, I'm really approaching this with a quite open mind. Right, mm-hmm. the, the bar for Resident Evil um, film has set that is set so incredibly low uh, that I think whatever <laughs> we do with this, it, it can only be good. Um, simply put, 
and yeah, it's always best just kind of. I think with anything Resident Evil, it's really easy to kind of get very close minded and kind of uh, sure think think about what you know it could be or whatever. At this point, cast seems encouraging. Like the whole the whole project seems encouraging. So let's see what happens. Definitely, definitely. Um, coming off the back of the films that we do have, and also you know we talked about it recently, the the Netflix live action show. Because of course now this is this is three things. It's worth you know pointing that out. We've got um, the Netflix show about Wesker and, and his kids. Um, we got the, the Netflix CGI show, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, coming up. And now we have another live action film. So there's a lot going on there. These are all separate projects. Um, none of them are, are connected um, as such. So, so it's, it's crazy. But compared to the, the Netflix TV show, which a lot of the reaction was like, oh, I'm not so sure about this plot synopsis and all this stuff. At least with this one, they are trying to adapt the games. Um, I'm, you know, if I had a worry, well, I guess it's twofold. One is you've got all these characters introduced right away, you know, all these major characters in one go. It's going to be difficult for all these actors to wrestle for the spotlight in this film, especially because uh, the plot synopsis that we've, well, we haven't been given a synopsis so much as uh, Johannes Roberts, I believe, basically saying that it's going to be an adaption of the first two games. Um, Right, so Robert Coulter, who's the franchise producer, said uh, something to that effect. So it's it's going to be about Spencer Mansion and Raccoon City, and that's why you've got uh, Chris and Jill and Leon and Claire. So they're going to try and adapt both the first two games into one film. That could be a bit tricky, Adam. This is where you've got your reservations. Just because it's like I obviously I understand the premise, but it's just another scenario where we're mashing all of these big characters together Mm -hmm. you know and and obviously it's going to tell its own story but it's to me it's just like another outing for the the big guys and how how good can it really be i'm hoping it's going to be good and fun to watch but there's just so much treading ground with all of these characters that it can get a bit like you know, we've seen so much of them. Like, these guys are obviously going to be different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a lot. I, and it's weird to have, like, such a young Wesker and an old Birkin. <laughs> like, so that's already a big departure sure. on their relationship, if they have one in this this piece. It's, mm, it's, it's interesting. I'll echo that. It's definitely, I mean, one of the things that, this this covers an awful lot of ground, as you say. Like it's if you think about kind of the events of the first game and the second game, they're huge in terms of that. Those are their own movies, all in all in one thing, sure. possibly even longer. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's something where trying to condense them all into like a you know, say it's a two hour movie is going to be really tough without glossing over a whole bunch of stuff. So it it's interesting. I think um, one of the things they might end up doing, um, and hopefully not. So I found with the Resident Evil 2 remake game was there wasn't actually an awful lot of character development in that. I think the kind of assumption was everyone who knows who Leon is because he's been in every single Resident Evil game ever. And everyone has a fairly good idea of um, of who Claire is. So actually, there's not that much exposition. Um, interestingly, playing enough that, interestingly enough, playing that game, Claire, I don't think, actually introduces herself as Claire to Sherry or doesn't actually find out Sherry's name for, through the dialogue whatsoever during that game. That's just something where players know that because they know the characters. It may well be that this movie does the same thing and that can save a whole bunch of time. Mm. But um, we'll see. Yes, I think whatever the case, (laughs) because of what they're trying to squeeze into, say, a two-hour film, and also the reputation of Constantin Films and what they want out of Resident Evil um, still being the sort of license holders for this, I wouldn't expect a game, uh, a film with a ton, ton of you know, character growth with a ton of dialogue. This is going to be a very pacey affair, I think. Um, Steve, any concerns on this front? Plenty, but it's it's the usual stuff, like you said, like Constantine films. Mm. It's uh, yeah. It, can they really ram what would be traditionally what two fifteen-hour experiences into the space of two hours? That seems insane. Uh, but at the same token, I get the feeling there might be some kind of Tarantino esque stuff going on or whatever. They try and tell both stories at once to keep the story moving. I I can't see it being all like, you know, yeah. here's the mansion incident. 
And now here's the Raccoon City outbreak, you know? I, right. Uh, not in two hours. No way. They're going to try and tell them both at once or something crazy, I bet you. I, but, um, go on. I would say that uh, otherwise it's just, it's the usual like trepidation that comes with the words Resident Evil live action. Mm-hmm. Um, the only real live action adaption that I think I've seen of Resident Evil that wasn't completely unbearable was the stage. True. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you were going on. No, 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 that was just it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I love this stage. I'm, I'm going to be on the other side of the coin, as usual, uh, with me. Oh, we love uh, it. Yeah. Um, the games are really not that long, and when you take all the puzzles, all the walking, right, this is going to be an action-packed game with horror aspects, uh, game, uh, film, yeah. with horror aspects. You know, you can do a lot in film uh, by cutting down a lot of stuff when you think about that, because, I mean, the games... What, uh, yeah, I was going to ask a question earlier on. What's the time period between RE1 and RE2 and 3? Three months. Three yeah. months. Okay, so it's not that far then. Like, that's going to be a big turning point if they're going to try and do all that. It says here, like, I mean, the story I've got up, that it's it's an origin story set in 1998. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that all happens within that period. So, yeah, I, th- I think it's possible. Um, I at the At this moment... Because we don't really have much more information, um, I'm pretty confident that these three games can be put into a film. Like just because I kind of have a little bit of faith in storytelling, but I, I also like I, I I just feel like it's games... constant. You remember it's constant in films, right? I do. It's just you know, it's faith I do. in storytelling. Uh, no, I mean overall faith in storytelling. I don't mean I, be- I know, I know. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think I think it. I, I'm I'm holding out a lo- uh, quite a bit of hope actually for this because I think all three three games can be put into a film, like of two hours ish over maybe two and a half hours. I'm just you know I I feel like to to, to backtrack a little. I'm not throwing this immediately under the bus. I sure. I would like to see a trailer first. You know, mm-hmm. I just uh, I said. Unlike most of the people in the podcast, I don't know half of these actors. Uh, I, I I know them from like their first appearances, probably. Uh, so, yeah, I, wait for trailer. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, could I could I release the uh, breaking news that I please do like literally an hour ago? <laughs> so, uh, Resident Evil. It's not really that huge, guys. But re- this Resident Evil film is currently being filmed in Canada in a place called Sudbury. And in Sudbury, guys, not much information other than that has been told, but we did some detective work. And in Sudbury, there's a lab named the SNO Lab. And give me a second. The SNO Lab is an underground science lab, uh, and it's located two kilometers below the surface of the Earth, and it specializes in neutrino and dark matter physics. So we think, yeah, the hive, yes, uh, <laughs> as I look at seen in chat, yeah. So uh, it, it would be really cool if they used this space, That's yeah, because cool. a real underground lab to be the yeah. underground lab. Because I neat. was having a look at the pictures of it, and it's like it's like underground, like Resident Evil esque. Like I'll, I'll post, I'll post pictures of it in the chat in a second. I but, love how um, we were like, yeah, oh, they might use the underground lab as the underground lab, and chat has dropped. Oh, ne- oh hive. Oh, nest three. Nest three. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's like it's built into kind of salt rock and stuff. Hmm. That's like, cool. It looks really, really, really neat. So I mean, I'm just you know I'm jumping the gun with this one, but yeah, uh, it looks pretty neat. Anyway, that's my news. I but have to ask, just, how did you come by this them- information? How did I come by? It's a, a friend, a friend of mine who lives in this town. <laughs> sent, oh, me mes- sent me a message this morning saying, "Dude, I just got a, yeah, I just got a message. Say, well, I just got an article come through on my phone saying that they're l- doing the live action recordings for the new Resident Evil film." And I was like, "Oh, sweet!" And they said, "Also, we think they might be recording it here." Because I said to her, "Could you go like have a look?" Do you know it's not a big place? And she she said no, uh, because it's probably in the SNO lab, and you're not allowed in there. So <laughs> the, top, the top secret underground lab that everyone knows about. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, that's it my news does. Anyway. But it does give us an opening for 
Steve Burnside to show up if it's in Canada. <laughs> it does. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so, our, so our next bit of news then, before we unravel completely. Um, <laughs> Resident Evil Infinite Darkness will receive a tie-in manga. Yeah, just just, a, just a short one. Um, it's not not exactly been made clear if this is just an adaption one to one of the Netflix series or if it's its own story that's related. But yeah, Tokyo Pop announced that they will be producing a manga based on Infinite Darkness, or or tying into Infinite Darkness was dev was definitely the phrase. So again, not really sure what that is. Um, no specifics on the story have been revealed, but it will arrive in 2021 to coincide with the show itself and, of course, the series' 25th anniversary. So um, I guess that's that's nice. You know, um, Resident Evil has a history of sort of comic books and stuff like that. Um, I feel like it's been, it's, been, it's been a little bit of a while since we had the last one anyway. Um, so, yeah, that, that's neat. More, more, yet more media for next year, between the long and short of it. If we get RE8 next year, it's going to be literally the uh, the most jam-packed, isn't it? Yeah, all these ideas for podcasts I had next year, and we're just going to be talking about what's new every every month by the sound of it, because there's a lot of stuff coming up. I On mean, the plus side, um, the Netflix show apparently has been delayed filming, so it won't be... We, we've got the film, but we haven't got the Netflix show right away, at least. <laughs> I mean, for comparison's sake, I think the only other busiest year was either the, the year the outbreaks came out, or Revelations RE6 and Operation Raccoon City at the same time. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Um, 2012, I don't think it's... Get, t- three games in one year, I don't think anything is going to top all that. But Oof. it's just going to get close. And now, reading the file, confession letter from Resident Evil Code Veronica. In character as Alfred Ashford, Retina. You can follow on Twitter at Retina8719. Alexia, my sister is a genius and possesses unmatched beauty. She is everything to me. I would overcome any obstacle and be willing to risk my life for her. For Alexia, I must revive the glorious Ashford family, which fell during the era of my father, Alexander. Together, we will restore our family name. Once that has been achieved, I'll build a palace where only nobles may gather. I cannot allow the unwashed to see my dear Alexia, to whom my life is devoted to. She reigns the world as queen with I as her servant. That is my dream, and how sweet it will be. Those accomplishments will be proof of my love towards Alexia. It is the purpose of my existence. All other people are meaningless, and they shall prostrate themselves before Alexia and I. Devoted to my beloved Alexia, Alfred Ashford. Okay, the subject of this episode's discussion is Resident Evil Code Veronica. Uh, A little bit of a backstory for this one. Um behind the scenes kind of look this was not on the docket for this year this was not my original plan but way back in the first episode of season two adam happened to mention that he's never played it before so i was like oh we should cover it and then over the course of the year it just seems to keep coming up we obviously did our claire episode and we talked about it a lot there and it just kept popping up so in a way it sort of led up to this moment um which is quite exciting because i know obviously it's quite a divisive game in a way and uh, i think among the five of us here we've all got uh, there's going to be some differences of opinion, so that's pretty pretty exciting indeed. So, Code Veronica was originally released February 3rd, 2000 in Japan, uh, February 29th in the US, and May 26th in EU for the Sega Dreamcast. Um, the original plan was to port Resident Evil 2 to the Sega Saturn, but uh, Capcom found it technically fairly difficult and uh, it would require major sacrifices to quality. Uh, the Nintendo 64 <laughs> version says hello. Um, but instead... Uh, of uh, sacrificing that quality they decided to make a new game in the series which then wound up being worked on for the Dreamcast and that is how we got to Code Veronica which was followed up a year later by Code Veronica X on March 22nd 2001 in Japan August 21st in the US and September 14th in Europe which is the the director's cut version 
Um, it was basically made to... It's kind of a double-edged thing. You know, there's, there's two reasons for it. Help the game sell because the Dreamcast already had a very low install base and even by... 2000 people were talking about how this is not really panned out had sega hoped um and obviously the car the console wouldn't last very long um so code veronica x also released on the ps2 or exclusively on the ps2 outside of japan um and it also included 10 minutes of new cutscenes and a new haircut for steve burnside um and also importantly the american version shipped with the wesker's report dvd which bridged a lot of gaps in the background to the story so code veronica x as a release was really good for the lore in fact um code veronica x is the version that gets ported across you never really see you'll never see code veronica standard it, it's pretty much lost the time now it's it's sadly kind of irrelevant um but it's been re-released on gamecube um, a HD upgrade for Xbox 360 and PS3, and then again for Xbox One and PS4. Rather weirdly, the Xbox One version is superior to the PS4 version because it's a port of the Xbox 360 HD version, whereas on the PS4, it's a it's the PS2 version. It's weird. It's weird what they did something very, very odd. But there you go. That's the history of Code Veronica. Um, now to talk about everyone's history with the game. Uh, Steve, what was your first experience with Code Veronica like? I was actually very late to the party. Well, I say very. It was pre mm. Devil May Cry one. Um, I never owned a Dreamcast, but I had a friend who was also into Resident Evil at the time, and they were telling me about how great this game was they had called Resident Evil Code Veronica. I was like, "Oh, okay, cool. Uh, I can't wait to play that when it comes out on the PS2." And then it came out, and I played the Devil May Cry one demo an obscene amount of times, <laughs> an obscene amount of times, and I played Code Veronica a handful. It, it was a uh, yeah. So it was around PS2's la- launch for CVX was my first real experience for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and James, your first experience was obviously playing it with Steve on the Let's Play. Yeah, yeah. I played. I played with Steve, and uh, yeah, it's it's crazy because my opinion has kind of wildly changed <laughs> since playing it. But uh, there are some things that have been still set in place. But yeah, I uh, I I did enjoy watching Steve play. I don't think I could have played it. Uh, Adam, well, we already know, Adam, this is your first experience playing the game for the podcast, right? It was my first experience playing it, but it's not my first experience with the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first experience with the game was actually on Dreamcast. My One of my friends oh. had a Dreamcast and had it. And I didn't watch the whole game, but I watched him play some of it um, at the time. So, yeah, that was my first sort of experience with it. But I was never... I, we'll get into it later. Um, and I have differing opinions on the game, but it never really grasped me. Cool. And uh, Sherwin, what's your your first experience with Code Veronica? Was it also on the Dreamcast, or was it CVX? No, I played it on the Dreamcast uh, mm-hmm. way back in the day. Um, to be honest, I mean, as as I'm, as everyone knows, I'm not the biggest fan of the game. I remember mm-hmm. playing it because it's a Resident Evil game, but put it down several times. I found myself saying. If this wasn't Resident Evil, I would have long since stopped playing. Right. Um, so that, that's the honest thing I can feed back. No, that, that's fair enough. Um, I I have it for Dreamcast um, as someone that... I did have a Dreamcast... Um, f- it was around the time that Sonic Adventure 2 came out. So what, what was that? 2002? It was fairly late into the Dreamcast's life, but I never actually picked it up for Dreamcast until years, years later, Code Veronica. But my first experience was the PS2 version as well. Um, but I, I've since gone back and picked up all the Dreamcast ports of, of two, 2 and 3 and also picked up the original Code Veronica as well. Um, but yeah, the first time I played it would have been for PS2. I don't honestly remember it, to be honest. My memory, as you guys know from listening to the podcast, is spotty at best. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, a bit of a foggy one, uh, but but there you go. Um, so um, I think I've got every version of it comes to think about. Anyway, I most recently played it on the GameCube, which was nice. Um, so I probably I've probably played it on every format. That's funny. So let's. I think I guess the best place to start with it in terms of breaking every every facet of the game down is probably the gameplay in a way, uh, because this is the classic. Um, tank control, sort of fixed camera. This one brought some changes. You got the sort of like tracking camera. We have full 3D environments for the first time. So there were some efforts to be made there in terms of pushing the series forward a little bit, but it's still the classic sort of gameplay. Uh, you know, s- similar to all the games that came before it. Um, this is a sort of on the cusp 
of the moment where things started to change, obviously you would see um, the Resident Evil remake only came two years or one year after Code Veronica, depending on which version, which is mind-boggling to think about, and Resident Evil Zero as well, uh, not too far off that, and then obviously things would change. So it is one of the one of the last of the classic style games. Um, Adam, why don't you start us off since you've got a bit of a, I guess, a fresh take for actually playing it for the first time. How do you feel about the gameplay? How does it compare to the older games? Was it weird kind of playing a classic styled game, but for the first time? It was super weird. (laughs) Um, I haven't played like, I mean, I think the last time I played like a tank style Resident Evil was, was the remake when I, when I sort of replayed it. Mm -hmm. But that, that even that, has like its own special place for me because I played those, you know, when they were quote unquote relevant, whatever you want to say, when that was the way you played Resident Evil. Right. Um, Going back to this one being a fresh experience, it was really tough. I really, it made me feel like I really hate tank controls. (laughs) Um, it, It was just, a very odd experience, yes. Mm. It, yeah, and well, it was difficult as well. Right. Like, it, it's funny how weak of a gamer I've become. <laughs> <laughs> how, because before it wouldn't bother me, but I was like, damn, this game is hard. Mm. I was like, I'm not finding, like, early game, I wasn't finding much in the way of health. I was depleting my bullets rapidly until a certain point. So I was honestly like, "Oh, am I going to be able to do this?" But yeah, it was, it was a weird experience. Well, I suppose you know, lack of lack of hailing items and lack of ammo that that's part and parcel of survival horror. That's the way it should yeah, be. Exactly, at the beginning. for but sure, for sure. I understand was, where you're coming from as well, because you know, as much as we all love the the uh, the classic style, they changed for a reason. You know, a lot of people. They wanted to that wider audience that doesn't necessarily enjoy this kind of game. You know, it's it's not hugely accessible. So obviously, twenty years after release, um, that's going to be a <laughs> yeah, a hell of a thing, I guess. Um, Steve, how did you feel about Code Veronica when it released in terms of the the gameplay, um, t- the changes, quote unquote? <laughs> how do you feel about the sort of I guess the three D environments and stuff like that? What did it bring new to the series? I suppose. I appreciated it to be fair because I, 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 despite my opinions on the podcast, I actually do not dislike Dino Crisis, and I wanted to see what the next step up, the next generation's version of those kind of visuals would be. Uh, that, that's basically what I see Code Veronica's like visual style and motif as. Right. Just trying to look at it with those Resident Evil camera angles. That's mm. cool. Like the, I would argue that the re. I mean, CV is much more closer akin to RE1, despite its 3D visuals, uh, in, the, in terms of the general aesthetics and the way the game behaves. But I'm sure we're going to probably go over that a bit more later. Right. The uh, the stuff that really drew me in, though, at the time, I think is more just the the fact to get the players clear again, you know? And you got to remember, this is pre-RE4, pre-anything. It's just so anything Resident Evil is still like, ooh, cool, mm-hmm. zombies. <laughs> I like zombies. And I wonder what Umbrella's up to. We've got to take them down. <laughs> uh, you know, because obviously we still haven't had that rock pull right. either. Yeah, absolutely. Um, James, what are you, any thoughts on sort of the gameplay and some of the changes made therein, if you remember? Yeah, uh, so I watched I watched Steve play this game, and Steve is an absolute master at tank controls. Like, mm-hmm. I've, he's a genius. I don't know how he does it because with me playing, I mean, when I played the remake on on stream for first aid spray, I uh, I could not do tank controls. I had to do analog. Because <laughs> I just I just, just want to jump in. We have a citation for that being completely false. Watch the let's play. I am not a master of tank control. <laughs> you shut your face. You shut your face. You should watch him play Resident Evil Director's Cut because this guy, all right, he surfs walls better than anybody. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, watching Steve play uh, tank controls like is 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 an art in itself. But like, I don't like tank controls, but it's you know, I, but at the same time, I I didn't really play games at that period mm-hmm. for like. I, I I played to, if I was playing with the with the with the D pad, it would be because I'm playing RPGs, 
you know, and they were a bit different back then than they are now. Mm. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, in terms of the gameplay, uh, I can see that it is very similar to the original three, and it is considered the third, right? Because <laughs> two and three is this like highly contentious <clears throat> opinion? Because um, like two, two and three are like part one and two, right, of a story. So this would be uh, the third. I think no. there's there's lots of different um, takes on it. I actually put up a, a stupid meme just this week um, with the the Michael Fassbender. I want to see the real um, blah, blah 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 perfection or all that. And it was yeah. with Resident Evil Three, but Code Veronica being the real Resident Evil Three. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's you know and, and lots of people took that in different ways and from my perspective for me that is um and we'll talk about the story part but that's from a story perspective i feel like this is yeah. um that yeah. obviously a lot of people yeah i wasn't talking about necessarily in terms of quality or, or anything like that but uh in terms of a story perspective but yeah yeah some people feel this is the real resident evil 4 some people feel this is the real resident evil 3 um three is kind of a side game so it, it, yeah it's obviously it's down to your discretion but uh it is what it yeah. is but it, it's the i guess the most important thing is that despite the fact that it's not a numbered game it's most certainly you know part of the main series yeah yeah and yeah but i mean to go back on on topic mm -hmm. uh yeah, it's. I mean, I didn't play it, so I can't have a crazy opinion on it. I just don't like tank controls, but that mm -hmm. is just uh, my skill with them. And as Adam said earlier on, I have been extremely spoilt with uh, analog and just sticks. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I just as an opinion, just opinion, just as a, a an aside, a reference. I tried playing um, Super Castlevania, like uh, at Steve's house on his little mini SNES or NES. Yeah. And yeah, man, that's hell. Like, I don't know how people didn't break their thumbs back then. James um, did not do deep heads. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that's as far as I can go because I, I didn't really play it. In that case, Sherwin, I'm very curious to hear what did you think about Code Veronica when it came out in terms of the way that the game played? And yeah, I think we danced around sort of what what. It, it, what it sort of tried to bring to um, the formula, or or did it even try and bring enough? You know that that I guess is the question. I mean, in pure gameplay alone, it's it's Resident Evil. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's classic Resident Evil. Uh, it's the way that it always should be played with tank controls, um, which you know will earn me some friends here. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, that that simply there's the, and there's not much else to go with that in terms of. I think looking beyond the other bits and pieces that it kind of introduced, I think you really start to... That's when you start to sort of discuss the other features of the game or other directions they took and so on. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I always thought was quite interesting is the 3D environments. It didn't dramatically change the way that the actual... No. For me, they didn't dramatically change the way the game did, but there was a nice follow-on. There was a nice follow-on from Dino Crisis mm -hmm. uh, to get to there, which I found, which resonated with me quite a lot to the point where I can just specifically remember the encounter. But, um, but yeah, that's more or less the only thing I could really say to go with that. Um, I think the it, did have, it had um, quick time events, didn't it? It's a little while since I've last played, but when you've got like the crates and stuff sliding towards you against the tyrant on the plane. Uh no no there's no time events in this one. Um, I, th I thought there was a thing where you have crates and stuff flying towards you. I might be slightly distracted. I mean that does that. happen in the cutscene, but you don't have to do anything. Mm, okay. In which case, you, you, we, yeah, you might be getting it mixed up with RE5 because that happens in RE5. Ugh. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah the, unfortunately, those games tend to blend a little bit. But yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, otherwise, yeah, in terms of gameplay alone, I think. Throw Code Veronica certainly fits there. I haven't got anything otherwise to say about it. It's when you start looking at the other features, I think you start going a bit... Mm. Mm. But yeah. Well, fair enough. Um, for me, I think that if you're going to bring the series to a a new generation of consoles, in fact, you know, we're, we're hopping from PlayStation 1 to you know, PS2 or Dreamcast, whatever, it, it's the same generation. I guess I just sort of looked back on it and sort of expected... For it to do more, um, it is it is for all intents and purposes it's a Resident Evil game, um, but it doesn't experiment enough for my liking in terms of the actual gameplay. Um, no major innovation. 
I can throw in a few things, minor tweaks that this threw over the form that not the others have done. I mean, we've got the whole dual lock-on system with dual wielding weapons. Sure. We've got the we've got the uh, per frame in a target knife that will annihilate anything. <laughs> yeah. The we we also <laughs> and then we have a return and more in depth use of the RE one inventory. You know, where you can scan your objects. I think that's pretty good. I think the the main takeaway for me though, it, it's weird. It was on the tip of my tongue and it's just disappeared, which is kind of irritating. I think it, I guess what doesn't help is that obviously um, with so many games being made around the same time, we talked about this before, Capcom, which is trying so many different things, including Dino Crisis, as you mentioned. Um, mm. It feels in some ways a little bit of a step back because RE3 had all these crazy ideas that they're experimenting with. There's less movement options in Code Veronica. You don't get your dodge. I mean, arguably you shouldn't. Jill has the dodge because she's a super trained soldier, you know, Police Chris, lady, yeah, but Chris should by that parallel, right? Absolutely, yeah. Whereas this feels a bit more classically yeah. stunted. Whether that's good or bad, you know, is obviously down to down to the player. But it does feel like a bit of a step back that you don't. Yeah, you've got the quick turn, but you don't have the dodge or anything like that. Really, the only thing that they seem to focus on was the three D environments. I I, I want to say you can push zomb- certain zombies off before they actually inflict damage. Is that right, or am I going crazy? No, I don't know. I'm not aware like, of that one. The, 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 the frailest, weakest ones. If you just literally mash the oh, push right. button. Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah. Uh, I really cannot remember. I apologize. I, I just I wonder maybe if that is this is where they started to realize that there's only so much you can do with this format, I guess. Perhaps, you know, that's one perspective to look on it is like, you know, they're tweaking little things. Um, but it's, it doesn't feel like a big generational jump, perhaps, that it could have done. Obviously, you get that massive change coming up with Resi 4. Maybe that's that's the way I'm looking at it. Um, you know, the 3D environments and the tracking camera, those are nice. They feel very at home. You don't really think about it too much. Um, it, yeah, Disagree. It, it, quite, uh, oh, really? Because I, I found that replaying it this time, um, when I started to think about it, I found that most of the cameras were moving, and I didn't, yeah, it didn't throw me off or anything. But Adam, how do you feel about the, the cameras? Um, 3D environments, really. Oh, right, okay. Like, it felt, this is going to sound weird, but it, the game felt really sterile to me. Right. Like, mm-hmm. just the environments uh, Yeah. were just dull. Um, I love the early Resident Evils f- because of their, like, pre-rendered. Like, the, there's so much to look at. Not so much in the first game, but, you know, that... That is definitely a sign of its time. Um, but obviously with 2 and, and the remake and then 3 and, and all of the games, I know some of them came after, like Zero, but they just all have such a captivating art style. Yeah. Um, and that was completely lacking in this game because, you know, they were showing off the quote-unquote power of the Dreamcast, which was ahead of its, you know, most of the other things out at the time. Mm. Um. But to me, that that takes away from the game so much. I feel if this had, if this was a pre-rendered game, it would have been one I would have played way earlier. It just looks completely uninspiring to me. I, I, I really, that's my biggest gripe with this game is I just don't like the way it looks. Do you know I have to completely agree? Really, I, uh, maybe not to the same extent. I like the way the game looks. I'm totally fine with it, but it's. You can't really argue, I find, that this is a better looking game than RE3 um, because of the sheer amount of detail in those pre-rendered backgrounds in Resident Evil 3 because of, you know, the nature of pre-rendered stuff. Um, Raccoon City looks insanely colourful and with loads of interesting little tidbits hidden around it everywhere. Um, Code Veronica doesn't have that. I think the uh, I think the biggest issue with the stuff there... Uh, uh, Code Veronica feels dated. Uh, because of this mm-hmm. and i think the biggest reason is it's the ambient storytelling that goes on in those backgrounds if you imagine your average raccoon city uh see, scene from re3 you know there's there's um like a shop it's got all the glasses exploded outwards where something has been smashed through or whatever there's a blood stain on the floor um you can immediately see that and your mind immediately begins to form an idea emergent narrative about what happened here you start to think about maybe that blood streak across the floor is where whoever got smashed through the window was dragged off by a zombie. Maybe the bits of glass, you know, 
you know, maybe again, where they came from, or maybe the bullets on the ground mean this or that or anything else. From memory, from the last time I played Code Veronica, most of it is really kind of quite stark, kind of open corridors with not much detailing going on. And as a result, exactly it, it, that it, it, it just yeah. feels it, there's there's no story there. It mm-hmm. just feels this really kind of like we just built this thing yesterday, and there's nothing happened here. It it and, feels and very result, unlived in. Yeah, right. And I think yeah. that's and to be fair, that's what we were talking about earlier. I think. Um, it just kind of clicked into place for me when you were sort of saying about the gameplay stuff. And I've always looked at this thing, the approach of saying, well, actually, one of the best things about our Code Veronica is that it doesn't at least mess with the gameplay, unlike a lot of the other stuff. But actually, perhaps thinking about it now, what perhaps should have happened is more that their focus is on trying to upgrade things that didn't need to be upgraded and right. instead, and, and, and kind of lost the focus there. In terms of making the 3D backgrounds and everything else, like the panning camera feels fun, and I distinctly remember the first time that actually happened, which I think is in the barracks, if memory serves, or uh, when you're actually on the islands. Um, I, that's the one that sticks with me. I remember that and thinking, okay, that's kind of cool, but it very quickly becomes this thing that just happens and you don't really notice it anymore. Mm. Whereas something remarkable, something interesting, they might have done to the gameplay engine, as in how you move around your character, whether you can kind of, I don't know. And, and, and if any number of different possibilities you could bolt into that would immediately be much more resonant and would create a much better precedent for you're playing on a new system now. And I think that's possibly the issue. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, well said. And well said about sort of the aesthetic a little bit as well. I really, I like, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the story, but, you know, we, we are removed from Raccoon City. We're not even in America anymore, Toto. Um, we're, we're, you know, in the middle of the ocean. So there's a complete... Uh, totally different art style, which is really cool. Um, the sort of European Gothic stuff. Um, you got fairy tales sort of bits sort of weaved into the narrative, and this sort of lullaby thing which tells the story. It's, it's really cool and really different, and I like that a lot. But I'd like it a whole lot more if there was more of it all the time. You know, <laughs> it's a great idea, but because of the 3D environments, um, as you said, it, it uh, doesn't feel lived in. There's not that same level of detail. Which is a shame because, like, conceptually, I really, really like it. Um, Steve, how do you feel about the sort of look of Code Veronica? Honestly, I'm, I'm kind of in Adam's camp, but I feel like this is the first real steps of the PS2 using these engines. Right. Like, uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying to trying to make defences for it, but at the same token, I mean, for every scene that's bland and sterile, I think, like, you know, there's that first, like, prison barracks like, I want to say, like, a canteen and, like, a, a bunk bed area. I mm. thought that had a lot of character in it. Mm. But then but then it's, like, boring corridors in the training facility and sterile, I mean, uh, lifeless area. Anywhere where people look like they've slept seems to have more character than places where they're <laughs> meant to be mingling and working in the lab, which I suppose makes some sense. But, you know, like, the courtyard where you fight the gulp worm for the first time, it's just a bland little dirt mm. patch with some barrels and boxes. Uh, it, it's... That stuff's kind of rough. But then yeah. there's that big sweeping bridge that you cross to get there, which has got a broken, like, you know, it's broken in the middle, there's a burning Jeep. That kind of stuff's cool. The door always around me at Jurassic Park, but that's completely irrelevant. <laughs> um, you know, it's it, it's it's a mixed bag, I think, in the fair, in the fairest state. Like, you know, to say it's, it's transition to 3D, some of its visuals, I think, work, but a lot of them don't. To be honest with you, when it comes to, like, the, the aesthetic package, uh... Code Veronica's biggest bugbear for me is actually the sound effects. Interesting. Um, I, I don't know if this is meant, meant to be the part of the podcast where we were talking about it. Feel free. That's feel free. But, but, but um, basically, although it uses pretty much the same sound library for any existing monster from like RE2 and RE1, respectively, the sounds for some reason feel muted or mixed less of a quality. And I, I don't know how, but it makes everything feel weaker and less punchy. You know, and... Uh, this also, I suppose, translates to the gameplay a bit. When you're like you're putting round after round into a zombie, there's not even that minute bit of hit stun or much of a register except a blood spurt, and maybe their shoulder will slightly jerk. Even less than RE2, mm. it all piles together to feel a little limp. Yeah, you that know, the sound effects for some reason just don't have the same punch anymore because they're swallowed up by either the ambience or the absolutely astounding soundtrack. Uh. It's, yeah, it's I can't. One. I can't say I, I noticed that, but I can totally take that on board. Although I will say that the assault rifle is pretty much the one. That, <laughs> that's the argument for the other side. The assault rifle is just ridiculously loud. Like, good no, God, no, it sounds I, like Christmas morning. 
To be fair, though, that is a new sound effect. That's it is. <laughs> right, that's exactly. Yeah, maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's, that's the, the truth of it. Um, James, how do you feel about the aesthetics of Code Veronica overall? Uh, yeah, uh, I like Nick Swain saying in chat, like uh, a typical kind of military base, they're not really that aesthetically pleasing. Mm. And like, although I agree... Like you still have to make the game, which is an entertain. It's meant to be entertaining the play. You have to make it exciting, and I like I agree with everybody that the like the 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 backgrounds and where you are in Antarctica. I mean, you're in Antarctica. It's going to be a lot of white and gray. Like <laughs> sure. it's just you know, like but yeah, they you, you know they could have punched it up a little bit. I think I made an, uh, a point when I was playing, uh, well when Steve was playing that. I was, you know, say if we were playing for more than, you know, three to four hours, maybe less, I would get bored because I would not know where the hell we were because I'd, I I wasn't cover- I wasn't uh, keeping pegs on it. Mm-hmm. Um, be- and that's because of the way the game looks. It is very dull. The color pal- palette is very just samey and neutral. And I normally like neutral colors, but they're so samey that I couldn't really keep up with the game. And it was just... Yeah, I like. <laughs> I, I don't worry. I will be singing its praises later on when it comes to the story <laughs> a little bit, right? But yeah, when it comes to the the gameplay and how it looks, it's just yeah, not inspiring at all. It's just not very exciting. Like as you said, Sai, RE three, RE two, like are very bright and colorful. Mm. Even though it's a horror game, you it's still survival horror, right? But yeah, uh, Code Veronica is just not that. It's just. <laughs> It's, you know, in in there there is a there is a role in horror, you know, and that is to give the player some reprieve, right? And you get that in RE two, in RE three, in RE one, right? With some with some NPC talks and stuff, but you also have the background to kind of liven up the scenes as well. Mm. In Code Veronica, there is no reprieve really. Right, and it, and even if there is a little bit of reprieve, the backgrounds are just bleh. That's all. I, the word that comes to my mind is just bleh. You know, is not yeah. Yeah, yeah. Code Veronica is in a weird position, in the you know, as Steve said, it's it's difficult because it's, it's the first game, you know, in a new generation. It, that's always a, a rocky position to be in compared to games that were sort of at the height of the last. I guess you know in its defense but yeah. uh I, t- yeah. I tell you what, another thing like i was going to say it earlier on um uh, we just we just uh, addressed gun survivor and it's crazy to me that gun survivor and veronica came out in the same year but yeah on different consoles, for sure. you know and you know it's even gun survivor is brighter and more colorful because of the just how it looked, you know, the, the, mm. the going through, you know, using the old uh, kind of models and stuff. It's brighter than Veronica is, even though they came out in the same year. That's very true, actually. Thinking, very true. Not, not to interrupt, but am I right in thinking that the PS2 version was a version that had the ambient blue fog everywhere? Is that uh, right? Yes, I think, a... I think that's a CVX thing, um, from what I remember. Yeah. It's been a while since I played the Dreamcast version. Because the um, the HD version, the the PS3, Xbox 360, Xbox One version has a lot of darker shadows instead. Yeah. It's, uh, mm-hmm. I would argue that the vibrant color, it, while not perfect, is probably better in that than the PS2 version. Um, yeah. And by example, I think the GameCube version as well. The GameCube version is is better. Some versions are, are obviously stronger than others in terms of stuff like lighting. Um, the HD version that you mentioned is really good for that obviously you know that's a big strength that they could apply some uh, more up-to-date technology on the lighting so the hd version is is quite yeah it it's smoother it's it's just a better looking game that's obviously the way it's going to be it's obviously difficult to judge a 20 year old game when there's various different versions like this but uh yeah fair point i see the reason I bring it up is because I've never played the original Code Veronica. I was just wondering where does that visually stack up does that still have like the same darkness the same blue fog or it's been this, honestly been a long is time. Is it too long? <laughs> yeah, it's been a, it's been a long time. I, I, I every time I feel like um, playing the game, I think maybe I'll pull the Dreamcast out and play the Dreamcast version just because you know why not? 
it's just I, a nice excuse to have the Dreamcast out. Plus, it's got the VMU, which is nice because you can see your character condition on it. That's really cool. But then you think, well, CVX has got all the extra Wesker cutscenes, so maybe I should just play that. So, uh, C- CVX is the one that came out on PlayStation 2, right? Right. Yeah, that's the version we play, James. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so I, I, I did... I did a little bit of research on this, um, and the P- yeah, so the PlayStation Two version and CVX itself is just a sharper game, mm-hmm. right? In terms of how it looks, so the fog is still there, but it is not so apparent, right? Because okay. of the sharpness of the game, like it just puts it in the background rather than the older game because it's a little bit a little bit less sharper. The fog is quite a bit more prevalent. Mm, that makes sense. One of the things they said when they were bringing out the director's cut was like, oh, you know, it's got however many visual improvements. So obviously that's that's going to be a part of it. But I guess, again, speaking to sort of like the beginning of the podcast, it does sadly mean that the Dreamcast version is even more irrelevant, irrelevant just because of the, the lack of the extra story beats and also just because it's not as good a looking game, I suppose. Um, we'll stay with aesthetics for a little while. Steve, you mentioned soundtrack. So uh, do you want to start that one off, the soundtrack for Code Veronica? Regardless of what anyone says about anything regarding narrative or visual presentation when it comes to Code Veronica, the soundtrack is a gem. It's like, I don't know if I'll put it as my favorite, but Mm. it's definitely like top three in the Mm. terms of Resident Evil um, original soundtracks. It's, it's, it's a strong OST. The, uh, the safe room theme is majestic, but then this one really goes in on the big boss themes. Like, you know, Alexia's yeah. themes are always like these big operatic, like almost like for a modern day parallel, like almost like a Dark Souls boss. Like, you know, um, mm. or well, maybe more Bloodborne, but I mean, you know, that's like six of one, half a dozen the other. <laughs> very operatic, very, you know, bombastic and like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, bah, 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 bah. it's all very, very that's well big. put together stuff. Yeah, it's it feels way more. I mean, if, if, RE2 is all like your scary carpentry, like synthy stuff, uh, yeah, your thing with a bit of bombast kind of music. This is the operatic, operatic score. We've got an orchestra in and they're going for it. Mm. And you get that right away as well with the sort of opening cinematic, the opening video, whatever you want to call it, before you even get to the title screen. Um, you get that classic piece of music, which is, yeah, it's massive. No subtle introduction here. It just straight goes for it, especially because, you know, uh, depending on what version of the game you're playing, you're seeing parts of the opening cutscene, which are, of course, pretty action-packed and ridiculous um, with the helicopter and all that stuff. Um, yeah, big. Big on sound. I agree completely. It's it's one of my favourite soundtracks as well. Um, some of the creepiest tracks in the whole franchise come from this. Stuff like, obviously, Suspended Doll, um, stuff from where you go to the creepy doctor's room whatever you want to call that and all the all the weird stuff like that it's got some superb music um the great save room theme as you mentioned um show and i know you're big on the music so how do you feel about code veronica's soundtrack is that a highlight yeah i agree it's um i don't think i rate quite as much as steve but it's certainly it's certainly one of the better ones i've got the recording somewhere from a thousand years ago yeah but um yeah it's there's nothing wrong here it's just it's just a solid soundtrack. It's not my personal taste is the carpentry kind of things that you mentioned before, and just mm-hmm. for future reference, everybody. That doesn't mean we're talking about kind of you know people hitting things with hammers and sort. <laughs> um, Some of RE2 <laughs> soundtrack does sound like that though. To be fair, yeah, I, I personally I prefer that kind of gloomy kind of uh, B movie almost esque kind of horror stuff. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I think this does a, this does a good job. It's from the sort of golden era when you had a lot of games like Final Fantasy and so on, they were really starting to hone a lens on right. soundtracks at that point. So nothing wrong with that. Uh, Adam, how did you feel about the score when you played through it? Um, yeah, playing through it, it really did harken back to the the classics. It, it was nice. I, I did enjoy it. It When it first started up um, and you get that kind of smash cut kind of cut scene, mm-hmm. it that was jarring at first because I don't think the music goes with that right. um, that piece of art. It the, the, very operatic with like running around a very clean kind of military base with helicopters shooting like Gatling guns just doesn't scream operatic music to me. Um, so it felt a little weird and I was worried, but playing the game, it it, it just felt so natural. 
Mm. It felt it felt like a classic Resident Evil, and I really appreciated it. There is um, there's something else in this that's very classic Resident Evil to me. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any games since this that have done that. But RE2, um, to some extent RE3, actually pretty certain RE3 has one as well, But and Code Veronica, they all have sort of light motifs that appear you know, repeatedly in different songs. Um, I think Code Veronica might be the last time it happened. I'm not sure if there's one in Zero, but I'm, I'm fairly certain once the games become more action-packed, it sort of loses that. You know, RE2 has very simply, duh, 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 you know, and you, you get that a lot in various ways. And Code Veronica has, as I mentioned, that lullaby, which you hear throughout the game. It's part of the story. It's part of the story of the villains, and we'll obviously talk about that as well. And then it becomes, you know, part of Alexia's boss themes as well. It's, it's brilliantly woven together, and it's it just represents that classic Resident Evil music. Something that I love about those, those in particular, those three soundtracks as well. are just so perfectly... You know, there's some actual thought going on even before anyone composes a note. You know, um, it's it's not just a series of tracks. This is a, a real collection. Um, so that's another tick in the in the Co Veronica column as well. James, what did you think about the score? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I when I was when I was playing with Steve, like Steve is uh, very very. Um, you can absorb his energy a lot, and I know he loves like the RE one, two, and three, mm-hmm. and we like we played you know them canonically so this came after three and i was it was like i was playing the older games though with the i think i remember just turning to steve saying are we playing final fantasy (laughs) when we when we got to like one of the bosses i think Mm -hmm. it was alexia at the end i was like this sounds like final fantasy and i am digging it this is great um yeah as you guys said earlier on it's, it's like play it's like you're you're fighting a bit bombastic monster but i yeah it might have been some some parts of the music may have been misplaced. I can't remember where exactly, but I do remember just loving the soundtrack. Um, and like Steve was also very very fond of it as well. So I was <laughs> I was just feeding off his energy mm-hmm. and going from the other games. I was like, oh, this is just basically the same. Just as Steve would say, one louder. <laughs> like with, with, <laughs> you know, with uh, <laughs> with with a lot of the 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 music and yeah, I, I adored it. I, I just especially love the music that comes on when you face Alexia. Um, in fact, I need to listen to it now. <laughs> yeah. Can recommend. Um, before we move on to stuff like story and plot, which I, I, I don't know if this is sort of me being totally unimpartial and just being like, let's talk about the stuff that's maybe not as good and then build towards, and we can just make the podcast sound like we're, we just like love code Veronica by the end of it. But maybe it's, you know, to be fair, let's cut it down for the most part and then talk about some of its perhaps strengths, or at least that's the way I know some of us feel about it. Maybe not so much others, but there is one thing that we definitely need to talk about in terms of it's sort of a gameplay thing. Mostly it's a pacing thing. Um, it's, I find it really hard to argue that this game has issues with, slowing the player down i think that's a lot of people's problem with it um so as an example um obviously resident evil 1 pretty much takes place in the spencer mansion and you're spending most of the game running around the spencer mansion up until the sort of last few hours or whatever and re2 is mostly the rpd and there's sort of like a string of locations after that that you go through in a line to get to the end re3 mixed it up there's no major location as such. You're running around a lot. It's very true to the game. Obviously, we talked about that in our RE3 podcast way back. CV, I think its experiment was kind of to have three locations for the most part and have you moving between all three of them. So you've got um, the prison, you've got the military base, and you've got the palace, I think it's called. Um, yeah, and the idea is that you are doing one and then going to another and you're just going to hop between them. But it winds up feeling very slow because you're moving around the same corridors, going back and forth, carrying one item to one area and then grabbing the next key item and rubbing it back. You know, classic Resident Evil stuff where you basically are just rubbing item on thing to get next item. You know, that's that's your list of objectives, really. But with Code Veronica, it's difficult because it, like uh, it feels like it's extending that playtime artificially a bit by making you run across that bridge a bunch of times and, and, and stuff like that. Um, Sherwin, how do you feel about this aspect? Is that something that you've noticed? Um, do you know, to be honest, again, it, it's a lot of that is part and parcel, I think, with, with what Resident Evil games are, especially mm. your first yeah, one. Yeah, of course. Like, if, you, if you think back to your first time you ever played a Resident Evil game, you are ultimately 
running around locations time and time again trying sure. to find somewhere. I don't have any issue with um, one thing Code Veronica definitely does is it's not correct. It's a false. It's a false impression, but it certainly gives you an impression that it's a, that you're running around larger areas. Mm -hmm. If you start thinking about the Spencer Mansion, you are running around quite small, quite com quite confined corridors. The actual amount of uh, ground you cover is pretty small, but because you're cutting between lots of small rooms in between loading screens, or alternatively because you're just going backwards and forwards so much, it feels um, quite a lot larger than it is. Whether mm -hmm. you see that Code Veronica's large corridors and large amount of space is actually an ultimate point where they kind of failed that test, as in they don't have that illusion working for them the same way the other games did. Or whether you see that as something where actually you look at it and go, well, no, actually the larger areas feel like that's an organic thing now, is irrelevant. It's almost, for me, the pacing is really, the thing that attenuates the pacing isn't necessarily the environments as much as the actual locations that you go to. The whole game for me feels super choppy. Right, and I think that, and I think that's the thing that makes me sort of when I when I think about pacing, when I think about Code Veronica, that's the really disjointed part versus the actual um, the backtracking. Interesting. I think. I mean, the argument I would make is that stuff like the Spencer Mansion and the RPD, you've got sort of you tend to have multiple routes. You know, if you're oh. on the first floor east and you need to get to the second floor west you can go directly up and then across or you can go across then up or there's multiple ways to do that with code veronica once you're in uh, location a and you need to take the item to location c you, you're always going the same way which i think james mm -hmm. might explain some of what your issues were with it being sort of drab and boring and, and somewhat confusing at times if you if you're not the one playing it and steve is just running item to location yeah i can see how I, that would I, be a problem yeah, Steve also, like, I think before we played, Steve's biggest complaint was the backtracking in this game. And my answer mm -hmm. to that was, have you not played Resident Evil 2? I know you have. <laughs> like, because I mean, yeah, like, they I, are, I will mention they are, this. They are, not, they are nothing but backtracking. But then when he played, I was like, oh, <laughs> that's what you mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there was also a big problem for me was respawning, respawning enemies. Like, why? Yeah, true. Like, it it was such a bummer for me, because it's like, that is a new thing that they brought forward, and it's like, you don't need to do that. Like, it felt like... Like, whereas 1, 2, and 3 felt like you were more in the story, because you were killing these things, and they wouldn't come back, um, in Veronica, it was... They were constantly... You know, in, in 1, 2, and 3 as well, there was still an invest infestation, so you can't even say it's because the island was infested. You know? Mm -hmm. But in Veronica, they just kept coming back, and it was it became this this slog of, oh, well, those bandit snatches again, ugh, mm -hmm. you know. And it's I have to get through here, and yeah, it was just, it, it was very very frustrating and disappointing. Uh, Steve, I'll let you jump off of that. Okay, so right, the backtracking it's it's a staple. Like you know, uh, for Resident Evil, it's part of the inspiration. Is like you know, oh, I found a key item, and I get to go back. I think the main reason why with CV it's a bugbear for a lot of people is because most of the other Resident Evil games, it's almost like a, a clean loop, like a clean movement around a building. Like for the mansion, you normally are doing like almost a figure of eight going around the place, getting the items, if, if this makes sense visually. Mm -hmm. But in Code Veronica, there's a lot of going to the edge of like an A cross, and then you have to double all the way back because you've got a key item to do another bit there to then bound around it, it, it's weird but it's, there's a lot of dead stops as opposed to like straight cut curling loops in the way sure, that you move yeah, around yeah, the building yeah you get a key item and you have to literally go to the like you know you go from the training facility to the prison and then you get a key item there you go back to the training facility and then you might end up going up to the palace you get something from the palace you have to go back to rodrigo who's in the you know the prison it's it's not as natural feeling it, it is padding i think it's definitely one of its weakest parts it happens in the antarctic facility as well when you mm -hmm. power things on you don't have to go all the way back over here to turn this on, that you probably could have just flicked the switch before you flicked it on, but no, no, no. Uh, that it, it, it feels very staccato compared to the other games. So that, again, I think that's more my experience with the previous games as kind of I have built a proper perfect map. But even with a perfect map, Code Veronica is just it's, it's tedious back and forth in comparison. Mm. There's no like clean route. Mm. I think um, I think also the other part to go with it is it's in this, the, a big factor to this is indistinguishable is is the lack of detail that you actually have to look at while you're doing this backtracking, yeah. and also the sense that um, yeah, and actually what, one thing that's added by things like panning cameras and so on, it makes it feel like it's one continuous kind of run. Even small things like hey, I'm running through the Spencer Mansion and I'm going through three different camera angles as I go around the corridor, for example. 
small things like that make you at least feel like there's a sense of progression or there's mm. a sense of something you're doing. One long camera just tends to grind into this long run that's just going on. And I'm not sure that's necessarily to its benefit. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Um, Steve, you mentioned that it happens in the Arctic, but also what the bit that annoyed me the most personally, also because, and I know I, I said I would bring this up online, uh, when you do the bit with Chris later, thanks, by the way, uh, Capcom, for putting the two big sort of twists of character returns on this game on the on the title screen with Chris and Wesker. That was, that was a <laughs> bit of a weird mood. Um, but yeah, uh, when you get to play as Chris and you are running around the sort of island area, you'll get to do... Um, there's sort of like a pocket of an area where you can only explore because of, you know, various explosions and stuff. And you're going up and down these three floors. And now the hunters are out as well. I died so many times because the hunters kept stun locking me. And it's incredibly frustrating because, you know, the, the tasks that I had to do were just boring, sort of. Run here, get this. Go up to this floor so I can get this. And then go back down to this floor so I can get this. Then go back up again. It just, yeah, it's it just repetitive. It's a pacing again, isn't it's, it? Just, absolutely. Yeah. You're right. You're right. It's, it doesn't feel like a gameplay loop. <laughs> it feels like a gameplay elevator. Um, yeah. Adam, how did you feel about this? Is this sort of the, one of the reasons that maybe you found yourself sort of bored by the game originally, perhaps? Yeah. Um, I, I, I will touch on Sherwin pretty much spelled out what I was going to say. Right. Um, in the case of the environments are not interesting enough. Mm. I v I very much enjoy backtracking and looping around um, the Spencer Mansion and Raccoon City because they're interesting to look at mm -hmm. and they're and they're in a sense they're relatable. We, you know, I mean, we all have been in a a city or you know we know what like a, a mansion should look like mm. but when you're just talking about some weird random military base how many of us have right sure you know real world experience to be like oh yeah like that's interesting because i can relate to it um so it just becomes they they in in my opinion of just playing it the areas just become shapes mm. it's just like, like these are the shapes i have to navigate this room is this shape and, and there's nothing to interest me as i move back and forth through the game and it does it like it does it, it goes from a military base where you're like well i i have really no experience of that to the antarctic where i'm like well i really have no you know i mean <laughs> I, same you couldn't you couldn't put it on like a freaking blander thing like of all of all the things you can do you know you you really are unlimited in scope when it comes to these games i have to jump in yeah, yeah. i have to jump and defend i can't believe in defending code veronica for a second just take a gasp <laughs> um but there are some areas that aren't complete crap though like, no no i'm not saying it, i'm not saying there aren't there definitely are interesting little touches like I it, it, uh, early game, I really love the little guillotine area. It has a lot of like right. whoa, like that's crazy. But but that is few and far between, in my opinion, and it doesn't help the game. Yeah, okay, that's fair. I, I was going to say but there I, are some. But I'm, I'm more than happy to concede to you, Steve, that there are definitely there are definitely interesting parts of this game. Just just in general, unfortunately, I feel it's super lacking, especially you know, coming from such visually gorgeous games. I want to just uh, point out that probably the, the worst offender for me of backtracking in general in this game, uh, if I, if uh, the, if the court will let me. <laughs> um, the, 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 the island is going to explode. We have put the, the three proofs to unlock the plane elevator by a jump we probably could have made recklessly, let's be fair. Um, and then we have to raise a bridge. Hmm. And then to get back around, that takes a good 20 minutes while this, this island is meant mm. to be exploding. I, with, with a tedious puzzle, but I mean, the puzzles, it's not the puzzle's fault. That's just the way it was built. Like that, that kind of game design is is, uh, is tedious to me. Where you, where it's, it's forcing you to literally do an entire lap around the island one last time as it's meant to be exploding, just so you can get around one raised bridge. Uh, uh, no, no, that's not, no, no, that's not good. I don't like that. Yeah, that one's fairly transparently um, 
Yeah, just just sending you on a pointless sort of errand, basically. It literally is. Like, you raise that bridge and then you have to go right back through the entire courtyard area, through the train facility, then all the way up past the entrance to the palace to get back into the sub pen. It's just because of one door that you raised yourself. Uh, uh, while Which would be fine, I suppose, if it wasn't for the, the same soundtrack, which admittedly gets old after a while. The, mm. the, the base, the island is exploding. Um, apparently eventually, in about three hours when we get there. And now, reading the file, Virus Research Report from Resident Evil Code Veronica, in character as Alexia Ashford, Reen Hurst, who you can follow on Twitter, at Reen AVA. What continues on the T-Veronica virus which I extracted from the Queen Ant? The more research I conduct on it, the more I'm impressed by how much potential it has. I have finally implanted the virus into my own body and discovered how to fully utilize its power. I will avoid making the mistake that I made on my father. I will suppress the activity of the virus at an ultra-low temperature so that my cells will change slowly. My calculations indicate that it will take 15 years before my body will gain immunity and become able to coexist with the virus. Until then, I have no choice but to trust the capsule that I will be in to that inept but loyal soldier ant who is my brother. For me to obtain unlimited power, some risks need to be taken. When I awaken, I will be the queen and the T-Veronica virus will be unleashed upon the entire world by my children. Every last creature on Earth will exist to serve me. At that time, the world will achieve the perfect ecosystem, just like an anthill, but on a much grander scale. (laughs) Alexia Ashford. Last thing before we move on to sort of plot and stuff like that is... uh, you just kind of you were talking about a part of the game, by the way, that just there. Whilst that bit is frustrating, you also get a fantastic bit directly after that. Um, I guess I'd like <laughs> to get some uh, opinions on sort of like set pieces. I suppose is where we're going with this. But fighting a tyrant on a plane is uh, a pretty special moment. I really, I think that's really cool. Uh, that whole bit, it's, and it's also quite original as well because you have to use it well actually i don't know if you have to use the box but obviously there's a whole point there's this box thing you can try to push him off the plane which ironically now i think about it it's kind of like the g2 fight in remake 2 but yeah trying to push him off with that box releasing thing it's yeah it's just this really cool moment right in the middle of the game um and of course on top of that code veronica sprinkles in a new thing a couple of new things as well you've got the band of snatch enemies i've always been a fan of their design i know generally speaking um, and I can definitely concede that they're, they're no licker, they're no hunter, obviously. Um, but they're they're kind of neat in terms of conceptually. They're sort of like tyrant runts that went horribly wrong and stuff like that, especially because it sort of lines up with the, the location and the fact that you're hanging out with this terrible Umbrella family that are sort of slipping behind, you know, Spencer and Marcus. They, they weren't really cut out for this sort of stuff, and we'll get to that. Um, yeah, I think it, it's strong on those kind of boss fights and set PC funds. There isn't really a whole lot of boss fights, admittedly, but uh, the tyrant stuff Optional is cool. ones, which is nice. Mm-hmm. You know, in defense of the game, it gives you choices. I mean, there's not really much reward for the first one. Right, this is true. Uh, yeah. But the fact you could technically opt to not fight several of the bosses is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, uh, Joe? Go for it. Sorry, Ty. Something that's really interesting for me is... Um, that's something that Code Veronica does do really well, mm-hmm. um, which is one of the worst. This this will immediately get me flack, I suspect. The most the one of the worst things about Resident Evil games is boss fights. Um, the whole game is built around this idea mm. of sustained terror and horror, and and this sort of sense of running around trying to save ammunition and trying to save health items and creep around, not trigger anything. Boss fights completely turn that on its head. And it's almost like their inclusion is there because back in the 90s when we made these games, everything had boss fights. Yeah. Um, The fact that Code Veronica turns these fights into set pieces and actually makes something of them outside of of the mandatory boss fight you have to have at the end and blow up a tyrant of a rocket launcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels very much like they actually try to run with it a little bit and actually try to push something. That that one, that aspect, I think, at least, is very, very... um, 
that's a very strong element to what Code Veronica did. They kind of took their, they kind of looked at this and went, how can we make these things interesting? How can we make players engage with them more than kind of just running around the corner, waiting for the tyrants to walk around, mm -hmm. unload a bunch of ammo, then run around the next corner and repeat until it's dead? Yeah, that's fair. Um, Steve, any standout set pieces, boss fights, uh, that kind of thing, creatures? The, the, the tyrant, uh, the tyrant on the plane, obviously is a massive highlight. I want to, I want to give a shout out to my boy, the the, the built up, the, the terror that is the Albanoid. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. I, can, I can hear the, I can hear the chat cheering it on as it's built up as this really big thing. You can just walk in, grab the plate, and bugger off. It's amazing. <laughs> like. Um, but now I know that sounds like I'm knocking it, but I love the subversion of expectations mm. because it actually is is on board with Umbrella's methodology of they make things that they think are awesome, but actually can be a bit crap. <laughs> yeah, like uh, as a set piece, I actually find it quite fun. Then, then there's obviously the um, the giant spider fight somehow the the build up there with like you know you see it under the ice and it's mm. uh, it's big, and then Alexia pretty much launches it at you. Um, Again, well, totally favorite, skippable. Yeah, yeah, again, it's another optional boss. I think one of my favourites is an optional, though, which is the Alexia first form battle. Uh, mm. Incredibly brutal, if you don't just wail on her with a magnum. Oh, yeah. Or, uh, because she will, like, enclose the entire area up and then throwing... The, 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 the theme of throwing her blood out, which then turns into fire and traps <laughs> you, and she just... She only has, like, two moves. That will grab you and set you on fire. So it's... it's Yeah, I think it's, like, one of the first one-hit KO monsters in... Uh, resi games, right? Excluding like the crocodile stuff like that, and the hunter, I suppose. Oh well, yeah, no, good point. Yeah, <laughs> the nightmare creature that is. <laughs> uh, James, any standout creatures, set pieces, stuff like that for you? Oh yeah, um, in the entire series of Resident Evil, Code Veronica has the best looking boss, and it's Alexia. Mm. Uh, type one Alexia. When Wesk is like, when she changes, and Wesk is like, oh, I'm going, I'm leaving, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, and then, <laughs> and then she turns into this like crazy evil nymph girl, you know, and I was like, oh, she's so cool, I love her, mm -hmm. please step on me and crush my skull, <laughs> right? And then, <laughs> you know, and then when I the, the end, like, just that design is so cool, mm -hmm. and if there is ever a remake, please, Capcom. Right, I just want to see that, like them, just to go wild with it, and because it's so unique and and mad. I think I just I li like when she exploded into the kind of this dragonfly amalgamation of whatever it was. Like I just whooped just <laughs> randomly. <laughs> you know, I was like, this this is great, and coupled with the music as well. Um, yeah, and I, I said in chat just now that the Albanoid, Steve was really hyping this Albanoid up. <laughs> like the entire playthrough, and I was like, huh, really? Oh, oh no. You know, and I was, <laughs> every time he was like, oh, watch out. Oh, oh, you know, and I was like, oh, this is, yeah, I like it. Uh, I don't know why. I'm scared. You know, and then yeah, I liked it because I, Steve, I like I, I like that kind of horror. It's, it's kind of funny. Um, right, kind of equipment. It could be the first BOW you could keep as a pet. It's, it... <laughs> yeah, it's. It, it, yeah, I think the the highlights for me are the are the the Albanoid, uh, Alexia, and also Nosferatu. Mm, yeah, um, Alexander, because like he was different, mm. and like it, I think every every boss in CV is very recognizable. You know, the like especially Nosferatu and, and Alexia, Nosferatu being having such a tragic backstory to him as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's oh, he's so, he's so unique and cool, and and also uh, during that scene as well, the uh, they they actually use the dull aspect of everything and the music to make it tragic. Mm. Like it felt sad mm. while you were while you were killing him, and yeah, I I felt really bad for him. Uh, yeah. So I I think my my top three would be the Albanoid is third. <laughs> Nosferatu is second, and Alexia far and ahead is the top one. For Fantastic. Me. I'm glad you brought up Nosferatu as well, because I completely agree. Um, we've talked about this in, you know, five tragic character videos that we've got on our YouTube, but I, it's it's almost, it's, you know, it, it's not quite Lisa Trevor levels, but it is that similar kind of tragic thing where then you have to face off with it and you kind of feel a little bit sorry for it. And we didn't really mention it, but this is the sort of first part of the game where you 
uh, get a different perspective. You get your first person perspective because you've potentially picked up the sniper rifle. Um, so again, just a just a way to mix up the boss fights again. You've got another way of doing it. You can stare down the the exposed heart that these things usually get with the scope of a sniper rifle. So that was pretty cool. And also, yeah. special shout out. You know, spider bosses in giant spiders is already a staple of Resident Evil by this point. But I really like that Code Veronica went a different route with it instead of the big sort of yes. big hair, like eight legged hairy freaks or whatever the hell that film is called. Um, it, they, instead, they went you know much more spindly. It's disgusting looking, and I love it. Um, Adam, any standout beasties or, or set piece moments for you? So, to, for for my own personal sort of experience, I I will say that I'm not all the way through the game yet. Uh, although I have <laughs> watched, I have watched the game, uh, and I I'm aware of the game through to the end. Sure. Um, over the years, um, for me, um, I like the plane fight a lot mm-hmm. uh that you mentioned that i just did that myself um i have an issue with it which i think it is like a hard reset point on the game if you get to that point and you're not ready you basically yeah, have to true. which is what happened to me which is why i'm not all the way through the right, game that's yet. happened to me as well uh, so i wasn't I prepared relate. and mm-hmm. i had to restart the entire game so that's Although it's a good, it's I'm very frustrated by it. Although I do enjoy it. <laughs> well, I, I think um, uh, my advice would be keep those uh, BOW gas rounds and some explosive bowgun arrows, and you should be all right. That's the way to go usually. Yeah, isn't that yeah, the reason? No, I'm. Isn't this plane fight and the, the almost the necessity of the grenade launcher why they pretty, kind of adjusted its placement? Yeah, pretty much. In, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it is it is a tough one for sure. There's not a lot of of room for error or to no, move. Sure. Or, um, but yeah, I uh, from from what I have seen of the game, like I say, I'm pretty familiar with it just from watching cutscenes and watching videos on the series. I really love the Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. It's it's super cool. It it's one of the more interesting enemies um, in the series. I feel. I really like that one. Cool. As, as an aside, I know we're going into narrative shortly, but how long was Alexia in cryo for? Fifteen years. So he has been sat there mm. with that with that axe pinning him down for fifteen years, screaming. Oh, yeah. that that, that pers- you, perspective you wise. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ain't nobody want that. It's gonna. It, Coincidental that he manages to pull it out of there just when you get there. Oh, of course. He... <laughs> it's got to be the agitation of hearing something above and realising someone else is here. Surely it's not just video. Yeah, well, actually, I, mean, I like It probably that. is video game. But of course. but yeah, yeah. You make a shed load of noise with that locker and stuff like <laughs> disturbing his nap. Mm. And also the other one, I guess, in terms of mixing up the boss fight formula is the, the moment where you have to run away from Steve. Um, well, basically, if you don't have at least one maybe two healing items on you you're done you know you're dead you're just dead there's nothing you can do about it which obviously that's not so great but again i guess it's part and parcel with the experimentation with what exactly boss fights are in this game um so let's not dwindle too much let's let's move on to narrative as you said steve um so Code Veronica is set um, over Christmas, 1998, essentially. Um, Claire Redfield has continued her search for her brother Chris into Umbrella Europe headquarters where she is nabbed by Umbrella and thrown on the prison island that the good majority of the game takes place on, as we've talked about. Uh, there is a T-virus outbreak and Claire gets free of her cell, bumps into fellow prison cell inmate if you like steve burnside um his father being an umbrella not employee necessarily but involved with umbrella in some way that's the reason why he's there and together they uh call signal for help try and find their way off the island um and along the way they also bump into the ashfords alfred and alexia so that's the sort of basics at the very least um the ashfords so just to start it off i suppose we talked about this previously um with the villain special at the beginning of the season and stuff like that but with resident evil one you've got this 
insight into umbrella which basically is just a lot of files and a slideshow and this one guy who's like a double triple agent thing uh, that's basically your connection to the evil corporation and that's fine obviously they're keeping it nice and mysterious you don't really get any inner workings of what's going on and then resident evil 2 um and i think we talked about this in the sherry episode gives us the birkins it gives us some humanity to what's going on behind the scenes with this evil company um but Code Veronica is the first game that really blows it wide open and tells you about who's behind all of this, you know, who gives you a real good insight into the families that founded the company. Um, in fact, it stars members of that family with Alfred and Alexia. It gives you the full backstory of this um, sort of runt of the three companies because Edward Ashford is, is, is not really up to the task of being a virologist and, uh, yeah, winds up having these twins... Uh, I find that whole setup really, really interesting and engaging at the time, you know, especially because, like I say, it's sort of been building up to who is Umbrella, what is Umbrella, what is the deep history of this company, and to find out that it's as quite as twisted and in many ways sad, we've talked about that as well, um, just I find that really, really interesting instead of the sort of generic... You know, Spencer's great, but, you know, he's a crazy man in a wheelchair who wants to become God. With the Ashfords, you have, you know, something much more human and stuff like that. Um, Steve, how do you feel about the story in general? I know I kind of went off on one, but just just about the story, however you want to take it. Story of Code Veronica. Uh, it, it's wacky. It's mm-hmm. zany. It's definitely the most uh, cartoony. I think. In a way, yeah. Uh, and I don't mean that in any slight. There, sure. there, there are some um, some pretty major plot holes, but the actual like character arc of like Claire getting in, mm. finding Chris, getting out, or rather getting in, getting caught, getting saved by Chris, getting out. Uh, you know that that's that's pretty solid. The the Ashfords and their their world, the the, the idea that you know even and maybe it's all the extra like side law, like Dark Side Chronicles and stuff. But well, it feels like almost like Edward and Alexander Ashford are the uh, the least evil members of the Umbrella Board of Directors, so sure. to speak. Uh, and then they get taken out by well, Alexander gets taken out by his own children, mm. who then you know they they decide to fall back into the actually let's be completely evil school of thought. But Alfred, I think Alfred's probably the standout. Like he's a character that's like at first you see him and he's completely just off his rocker with a sniper rifle, being a full maniac. And then you learn he's got like serious, serious psychological issues, uh, you know, over the uh, disconnection with his twin sister, and that that's genuinely intriguing. The the fact that the man has a complete breakdown over the course of the game, he's still a complete git. He's still mm-hmm. a complete like you know, totally. you know, he's on a rimmer. You'd kick him down the stairs, you know. He's, but it, he has a lot more depth, I think, than any other character in the actual game in terms of what happens to him, what he goes through. Alexia, she pops out the pod, goes. <laughs> <laughs> I am evil. Look at my evilness, and then dies. Uh, you know, Claire. Obviously, it, it, it's fine. She just follows the through beat through beat scenario too. I suppose if anyone's second place, it's probably Steve. I need a better voice actor, Burnside. You know, uh, but that's again the, the tragedy. There is undercut by the uh, the quality of the voice acting. He's actually in Dark Side Chronicles. To his defense, the actual character has done a lot more justice. I think. So I, I, I'm trying to be even-handed. <laughs> uh, but then there's Wesker, <laughs> who shows up, just smacks everyone around, and then punks out, <laughs> and no one can stop him. And it leaves it all hanging on a beautiful plot thread that doesn't get picked up again until RE5. Mm. Uh, but every scene he's in, he steals. So I suppose there is that. Chris, the man's a cardboard cutout. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's fine. <laughs> yeah, he, he's okay, but mm. RE1 Chris is much stronger, and he had a terrible voice actor, let's be fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, as sort of previously talked about, the quote-unquote real Resident Evil 3, this is kind of why, for me, the whole Claire and Chris thing. You've got Chris as the protagonist of the first game, or one of them. Claire is the protagonist of the second game, or one of them. And in this, they, they finally come together. So for me, it's sort of, yeah... It's the the wrapping up of the trilogy of the sort of Redfield saga almost. Um that that I I love that and the symmetry of that sort of like sibling uh pair with the Ashfords as well. But yeah, shout out to Wesker in this, you know. Richard Wah 
is the quintessential Wesker. Because before this, you know, Wesker just sounded kind of like a normal guy. It's Richard Wah's sort of drawl that he brings to Wesker and the sort of chuckle and all that. This is really where that character, the Resident Evil 5 DC Douglas character that it becomes, this is sort of where that starts. Obviously, as, of course, as well in the plot as well, because he's, he's come back from the dead and he's got sort of magic powers where he can run up walls and punch fire or whatever <laughs> he does. Absolute nonsense. It's, you say, yeah, you say, it's a wacky, wacky game. Uh, James, how do you feel about the story? I know you're you're in the positive camp as far as I as I know. Yeah, I really like uh James has a boner for origin stories. <laughs> I really love an origin story and this is the beginning of everything. Mm. Like it's it's giving you a roadmap of how it all began uh with some things that are not explained, but that's okay because a lot of Resident Evil 1 through 8 and it's subsidiary uh games there is a there is a lot of things that are unexplained it's deliberately done like that so they can be explained in firmer further uh further releases but yeah oh man it's it's so cool i mean with my my fanfic like it's kind of based on this yeah um it's it's based on alexander and the clone theory and uh, the intellect thing that he did to he did, he just did it because he wanted his his family to be reborn and uh, he didn't really think that far ahead you right. know he yeah you know which he should have maybe done silly silly Alexander but he did not deserve the fifteen years of solitude as a uh, yeah as as a as a was it? he was infected with the code Chief Veronica. Virus. Yeah, mm. right. He did not deserve that at all. Um, yeah, and I just, I just want to speak just quickly about Alfred. Like I've already spoken about how Alexander is just a tragic character. I, I feel really bad for him. Alfred, though, is also really, really sad. Mm. Um, yes, as Steve said, he is a git, but also um, he's been sitting there for what is it at this point? Uh, how how years long since she's alive? Yeah. yeah. Because he's not. Yeah, he's he's been there his entire life, you know, waiting, mm. you know, and then somebody comes and it's like have, you know, it's like coming out of the pandemic and meeting your friends, but like <laughs> hundred times worse, you know. And he's like, oh, there's a new person. Oh wait, are you a security threat? And then he just completely goes off his rocker mm. and yeah, uh, without going to too much of the comedy aspect of it, because Alfred is just hilarious. Um, I mean, you, he lives in his own version of Castlevania with a giant moth lady statue. It's <laughs> he's pretty out there. Yeah, it's, he's just he's just so I, I fully believe him, like in how crazy he is, and I really like the. I know this is kind of an unpopular opinion, but I really like his voice direction because I do truly get the idea that he is bloody bonkers. Um, and once you know kind of his backstory, it makes sense. And then there's Alexia, who is his mirror. Like she, like he, his whole purpose was to, was to die and bring her into, into the, cause she would have killed him anyway, mm. um, because he was a lesser, you know? Um, mm. And then Alexia comes and what I like about, her, I mean, Steve says she pops out and says, I'm evil, ha ha ha. But she actually pops out and oh, she's silent, but no, when she starts yeah. talking, then she's a cartoon villain. Yeah. But it's just like, I love that reveal of her. Because it yeah. is very strong and powerful, and it was super cool to see that. Um, yeah, and then like I, I'm, I'm in love with Alexia just because of her, her boss phases and just her voice is really like just oh, someone is making loud bangs outside my house. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, she is very. Uh, I would say if she was given more time, like she would have been the quintessential kind of bad guy you know if if say chris i know that was the whole point of the game but if claire and chris didn't do this like she would have been the top dog mm -hmm. for you sure know, if she was given more time to uh to kind of grow and evolve um yeah uh in terms of like just uh, the story overall i really really enjoy it um as i said right at the beginning it's an origin story Mm -hmm. Right, and I love that. Um, and I would like in the future if they can just build on that a little bit. Um, you know, you don't have to explain everything, but just build on that. Mention them a bit more. 
Um, it's mentioned that Alexander worked with, uh, is it Edward on the progenitor virus? Um, so yeah, Edward is his father, um, who was, sorry, right. I sort of misspoke earlier. I think Edward is technically a virologist, but Alexander wasn't. So the problem was going to be that the other families of Umbrella were going to excel. Whereas uh, Alexander was, that wasn't his speciality, which is why he used what he did know to create the twins uh, by splicing genetics and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. That that that's that's super cool as well. I was like, yeah, go like you could make a series based on that. Mm-hmm. You know why? What went through there? What were they going through that at that time? Imagine like going kind of way, way, way back because like I mean, was it forties, fifties? This happened in like it's just. Go way back then. Give us yeah. a whole new perspective. Absolutely. On, like, on what Umbrella was like way back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and that's why I like the story, because it makes you question, it makes you want to expand on it, and it makes you want to know more. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah. That's the way things obviously went a little bit with um, with Zero as well. You know, you get more of that insight into who these three men were and their relationship. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I... I Generally speaking, I, I would I completely agree. And and when you're saying about Alexa as well and kind of the reveal, the way that's done is, you know, there's all this chatter about Alexia in the private residence and nobody's ever allowed to look at her and all this stuff. And you get that sort of sort of shock that it it's been Alfred this entire time and, you know, he's been so lonely this entire time and devoted to his sister, which as you sort of find out later, doesn't really care about him particularly much. Yeah. Um so sad. Which, again, yeah, that is part of that sort of tragic um, nature that he has to him. As much as he is an awful human being, because like you say, there's there's all other files that say about how he likes watching people be tortured. You sit there and drink wine while the evil doctor cuts people up and stuff like that. He's messed up. Um, but you get that reveal that, oh, you know, he he's Alexia. You know, oh, okay. Um, I get maybe there is no Alexia. And then later you get to meet the real, you know, super genius. Yeah, cartoon villain. There's a lot of this game that is very wacky and zany and, you know, genetic splicing and yeah. stuff like that. We're taking some some big sci- sci-fi jumps, which I know is, is the next point of the discussion. Um, but technically, in terms of a, a story, I feel like it all fits together very well. And in, in a nice... It's complicated, but not it's not impossible to follow, even remotely. It, it's, it's... Yeah, it's just a very detailed lore. Uh, Sherwin, I know that the sci-fi jump in this game is kind of a problem for you, isn't it? Yeah, do you know, if I look at Code Veronica, the if I go back to when I first played it, the the honest re- the honest reception is is it's a game, it's a Resident Evil game which feels it has a couple of shining points. The the boss fights f- generally feel quite fun. Mm-hmm. Um, the as in they try to actually do something different to break the mold a bit, which is cool. And the soundtrack we've already talked about. Outside of that, it's quite a lackluster game, if I'm entirely honest. Um, but irrespective of whether it's kind of more of the tried and tested formula, but not done, quite done so well, uh, which I think is fair to say of the backtracking and the exploration, the other bits and pieces. For me, this is the point where Resident Evil started to think about jumping the shark um, in terms of the story and the science fiction elements and everything else. Um, the level of depth in the enemies, for example, isn't isn't sinister. It's mm. It's not sinister. It's not that thing where again it's letting your mind do most of the work it's something where they are literally cartoon villains you have a crazy guy dressed up in in a very old british military uniform with a rifle running around laughing like an idiot you have uh code for you have you know um alexia who's just evil for the sake of being evil um you have steve who granted has literally the exact same emotional sort of um depth and, and versatility of a 16 year old boy is what you should do but at the same time realistically that doesn't translate very well for you as a player kind of playing this and even you know chris is as wooden as he was in re1 which is kind of who he is to be mm. fair but and i think you missed the better points of claire's character in this as well uh, if i'm entirely truthful one of the defining points about claire was her empathy for kind of sherry and and who she is as a young woman i don't see that doesn't really come through in this she's almost quite bland i find um but truthfully it, it is the elements where you do get to the science fiction stuff it's in terms of the character you know says some of the enemy designs like the bandersnatch and stuff and and the enemies they just feel too far pushed i mean nemesis was scary because at various different stages 
you are kind of starting to see more elements of it, sort of you know, skin melting off or whatever to reveal mm. tentacles and stuff underneath. That's horrifying. The same as kind of all of the various different BOWs you meet across the way. By the time you get to this, you're kind of starting to look at your first instances of jelly monsters, and that's not a good thing. And obviously, the natural the natural progression of that was RE zero when you got to the leeches, and that's also bad. Um, I think some of the story stuff you're you're sort of introducing in is quite cool. I like the way that Capcom kind of went went over the, or the game designers went to approach of well, let's tell a larger story. Let's try and set this thing now beyond the world that we've created, which is the instance of the outbreak. Mm. But I think that was something where that, and as a platform, that's not awful. But I think it also kind of started nodding towards when you start looking at cloning of things, you start pushing towards, well, realistically, you get towards Resident Evil 5 very, very quickly, and that's a bad thing. But ultimately, the worst thing by a country mile and the thing that actually did make me just put down the controller and pl- play this game for at least a week was when Ninja Wesker turns up. Um, <laughs> quite frankly, that that fanboy level adherence to the Matrix is God. Mm. It's just terrifying. It's something which it, literally I can't say enough as a personal bugbear. That kind of bit where the Matrix came out revolutionized the way that some people looked at cinematography and fundamentally changed a whole bunch of way that everyone looks at kind of video games, everything for at least two years afterwards with bullet time everywhere was just sure, yeah. god awful. Absolutely god awful. And Wesker is possibly one of the worst instances I can think of that in this game. It's just so, so, so bad. It actually works as a deterrent to make me never want to play it again. I can't be. I can't. I can't honestly say it stronger than that, or say it say it less harshly than that. Interesting. I mean, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. Totally. It's it's very out of left field, and it feels, in some ways, very disconnected to you know the original game. It's, you know, it's not it's not it's, the Wesker that you knew from that game at all. It's basically Devil May Cry, which is cool if it's Devil May Cry, but it's not Resident <laughs> Evil. Yeah, and it's that simple. Um. So, Adam, this is the one I'm curious about. What is, what, where do you land in terms of the story? Um, good, bad, indifferent? I, ha- I have really conflicting... This is the one I'm most conflicted about. Mm-hmm. Because there are things I really like and there are things I absolutely hate. Um, I was definitely surprised that they decided to go as lore-heavy as they did, especially as it was a new game on a new system. True, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's I would have imagined they would have done something a bit more dumbed down as it were. Um, but it's not a problem. The I'm very appreciative of all the extra lore that we get in this game. And I, and I think that's definitely one of its strongest points. Um, but I feel like I have to side with Sherwin on characterizations. Um, I do like Alfred. Um, I think that he is a fun villain and I don't think that that's a problem every now and then. Um, and I think they did a decent job with that. Um, Wesker, I will completely agree with show and it's, it really bothers me because it, it kind of stands out where I'm like, what do you want your virus to do? Mm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like it seems that that so many different weird things happen from the same set of viruses that it just doesn't make good law sense. It's like what's going on with Wesker? Why is he doing that? And it it is exactly like showing said, it's the matrix effect. You know, where it's like, wouldn't this be super badass? But it just comes off as kind of weird and unsatisfying, ultimately, for me. Um, I really like Wesker from Resident Evil, where he's just a, you know, a bastard. Um, And I don't like super bastard Wesker. Uh, Steve can (laughs) die in a fire. (laughs) <laughs> no no steve i know you share a name sake, but just no he d- there's nothing redeeming about that person <laughs> i hate him he's he's a horrible character 
He's got a horrible, whiny, annoying voice. He, at every chance he get, he points a gun at Claire, even though he's not threatening her. He'll just, like, suddenly throw his arms up and point guns at her, like, hey, lady! Like, you don't just point guns at people. Oh, God, I hate him. He ruins the whole game for me. No, no a tear shed for when he passes away. Or a I'm glad. Point. It's the best. <laughs> I wish he would have gone out as more of a chump. Uh, I actually, yeah, I can't but agree there. That that was a highlight that did actually draw me back into this game briefly. When <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like I, I kind of mentally checked out and kind of was just playing it to say I'd finished it because there's part of me that apparently is masochistic enough to want to get to the end, despite Jelly Monsters, Ninja Wesker, and this annoying character that just turns up and doesn't really feel like he belongs at all. But when the character dies, I almost hit the ceiling. Why I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. reasonable, reasonable think... reward for that cannonball puzzle. Do you think? Uh... <laughs> like Steve, Steve turned to me when he died, and he said, "I, you know, I mean, it's a little bit tragic, isn't it?" I went, no, <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> and say, and oh, on top of all of that, the I just want to throw in there that this series has the worst looking monster of all time in the freaking bandersnatch yeah. <laughs> it's not no, no, it's not scary that. it looks stupid it has a weird like its animation is stupid it's stretchy <laughs> arms it's just dumb as hell and i hate it yeah it's inter- it's interesting just a side note if um we landed on this we were talking about the lore and stuff i actually had a quick look um because I'm not playing the game anymore, but I certainly looked at it in terms of the sum of the law. Because I remember a few things that kind of read funky the first time around have stuck with me. And the three that I can pull up is there's a prisoner's diary that you find where basically someone says, you know, like they've dragged off my buddy and, you know, into the building that no one comes back from next to the guillotine. I wonder why that could be. And then kind of says, okay, I'm going to go and I will escape later tonight and go see if I can find out what happens. They then come back to their cell after escaping from prison to carry on the diary. <laughs> I might have to look oh, we're talking up. these kind of things. Oh, 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 well, can, uh, I, can I throw out a question? And I genuinely want a truthful answer, okay? All right, Claire and RE2, what is she doing? Why is she there? Looking for her brother, Chris. Yeah, for Right, him, okay, Chris. right. She sends an email off to Leon. Yeah. And he just has, yeah. he's, he's, he's just got him on instant messenger, and and Chris <laughs> turns up. What? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying, right? She's in this umbrella facility in Paris to look for her brother. Gets kidnapped, and then like, oh, I, I guess I guess man hunting him across the across of Europe didn't work. I'll use I'll use instant messenger. You know, like oh, back then, mate, it would have been ICQ. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah you, you MSM. Get, it was MSN back then. The, 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 the swiftness with the way that Chris can get res- can respond from an email or whatever from Leon Kennedy, who knows that Claire is bag- looking for him. Yeah. <laughs> Fair when point. did they? When did Leon and Chris meet? Uh, uh, Re six. <laughs> <laughs> That's not for a few years. That's exactly. Not for a few years. This is only set. This is only set like three months after two, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. And I, I, I just, I, I, not to unravel everything, but the, is there a legitimate reason for this? Like, because this, this, the, the but plot Leon's kinda... name in it. <laughs> I honestly even care though, for that. Even though, which is funny, because at this point, Leon wasn't a thing. You know, it wasn't like, oh, Leon. Um, but they, it seems weird that they felt like they had to shoehorn in. They dropped his name in his this name and Survivor, funnily enough, right. both the same year. So they obviously knew that oh, Leon's going to be off. Right. Our pseudo, pseudo in chat, live chat has said that Chris's MSN status was set to away, so Claire went oh, looking okay. from worldwide, yeah. uh, whereas Leon just went the direct route, I guess, and yeah. went, "Bro, you there? So, your sister in trouble." Call um, on Skype. See. see. The thing is, Leon never sets his MSN to a way. Mostly, he even turned up in Gaiden. <laughs> yeah, he's down for He'll show up to the opening of the envelope. So, you know. We say this about, oh, you know, Leon wasn't a thing back then, but Leon totally was a thing. As soon as, like, you know, his, his magnificent locks graced, graced RE2, <laughs> just, he just locked in at that point. Uh, we we got far and away from what I was going to say about trying to. I was going to try and defend Steve Burnside. I don't know. I don't think I can. Obviously, everyone's got their opinion on him already. For me, 
the voice acting is the real letdown. As a character, I don't mind him so much. I think he represents another opportunity for Claire to show a nurturing side. But but not like, oh... And this is kind of the thing with Claire. It's always like become about looking after young girls and stuff. With this, it's more like looking after a bit of a teenage idiot. That is clear. Obviously, you know, that is Steve. He's a dumb teenager. So I... I like the idea of what they were going for. And Steve doesn't... I don't hate him overall. There is that one moment where he tries to kiss her while she's asleep. That that can that can get in the bin. That's If you put that ah, in a remake, then ah, uh, no thanks. Ah, <laughs> but otherwise, oh, he's fine. He doesn't stare a bomb and crash a crane into a... Yeah, like, kind of, but... I mean, filling it's a not, room with poisonous gas. It's not a justification, but he is a teenage boy and this is a game from the 2000s, so I'm really I, not surprised. I, I, to be fair, I am actually on a. This is this is nightmarish for me to say. Just give me a second. I am moderately in defence of Steve Birdside. <laughs> like his voice acting, co Veronica is abysmal. Like uh, I'm swarry. It's just terrible. <laughs> I'm um, swarry. Yeah, uh, uh, and is whenever he tries to be serious, I just say the same thing, but slow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot. Uh, you know, but. The thing is, he is literally a horny teenager who's trying to impress Claire. Mm -hmm. And that, as a character, is insufferable to watch, but it is a character that he is portraying. Mm -hmm. It's done better in Dark Side Chronicles because better voice actor, but he's still, he's just a young kid. He's he's a young kid who, for some reason, during the zombie apocalypse, has got a hard on and is more prioritizing that than trying to stay alive. (laughs) And uh, that. Yeah, it makes fair. him a clown. Yeah, that's fair. But oh, also, he's, he's he's a teenager, so I would uh, argue. Oh, sorry, go on, Sean. I was gonna say, what teenager doesn't want some shining gold lugers? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> bling and bling. I would argue that he's done better in the St. Berry book. I know we've got a while until we get there, but they, she did quite well in terms of writing him. I don't like him in Dark Side. I think his voice is too generic. I, I mean, I'll take it over what we got in the original game, but he, he yeah, I don't know. It, 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 a lot of Dark Side's retelling of this is sort of rubs me the wrong way, but, I'm, but I guess one day we'll we'll get to that and talk about that. But there, there's Although, some great scenes in this that are so much better in, in, in the original. If they remake it, which, you know, uh, never never say never, less sure. uh, less of the uh, the creepy stuff, like trying to kiss this woman who's asleep and all those yeah, other things, we, we please. Can, yeah. We cannot because that's that that's that's borderline offence. Like mm. you know, that's that's prison time, boy. That's not good. I think get into another. He's already in prison. Ah. Yeah, exactly. You might as well just stay here. Um, there are a lot of things that I mean, we're kind of like winding down now. But I think if this game ever got remade, there's there's it's a good game for it in the sense that there's there's some great stuff here, that, and the stuff needs to be cut and pasted, and you know, cut down on the backtrack and make it a a much more enjoyable experience to play. That sounds really harsh, but you know what I mean? It's it's much more fluid experience. You can cut out some of the terrible Steve stuff. You know, that we've talked about this in the villain special. There's a line that Claire says you can completely cut that out now in 2020. That's not necessary. Um, it's a game that actually would, you know, a remake would probably be a good thing for it, but there you go. Um, so let's get some final verdicts. Um, Sherwin, why don't we start with you? What what are your final thoughts on Code Veronica? I think Code Veronica was came out at a time when Capcom were really trying to look at okay, so we've made reson- we've had we've very much explored the outbreak incident. We need to expand on that. Uh, you know, how do we do this going forward? And I think Code Veronica at that point really is the basis of a new Resident Evil, and then ultimately. It's something where actually the next game in the series, which is RE4, didn't really pick up on that in the slightest. It kind of skipped a generation and then went straight to five. Um, mm. And truthfully, I, I, to be honest, I think for me, as as I've said, the, the start of Code Veronica is the start of elements introduced into the into the series and the genre, which for me just just break it. It takes away so much of the survival horror element. It's just a step too far in many different ways, which is a shame because at core, it's it's an old school Resident Evil game. It's, you know, it tank controls, kind of, you know, the backtracking, everything else. It's a shame that it wasn't the sort of, um, wasn't the final entry of that particular style of playing until we got to RE Remake, really, or mm-hmm. even perhaps Zero, um, which both feel like a better release in the series. 
yeah, it's 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 in an awkward place. Like we say at the beginning of that generation, you're following up that classic trilogy, and then yeah, just a few years later, remaking Zero, at least from an aesthetic point of view, you know. Yeah, I think I think honestly, if I'm to look at this game in terms of how it fits into the series, I think Survivor in the opening scene, nor the cut scene, like at the start with Vincent falling out of a helicopter or whatever, but. Ignore that for a moment and just think about that opening scene when the character lands, looking around an empty kind of uh, alley and there's a zombie laying on the floor. That alone has more uh, depth, more Resident Evil feeling and sentiment in it than the entirety of the Re- uh, Code Veronica. Whew. Big words. James, you're up next. What's your final thoughts on Code Veronica? Uh, the gameplay is not great for me. The soundtrack is fantastic. The bosses are great. Steve Burnside can burn. <laughs> uh, Claire Redfield is... Uh, I mean, Sherwin put it really, really well earlier on. She's just not interesting in this, in my opinion. Um, but the story is great. And the lore we get, I really, really enjoy uh, reading into it and writing about it, because I've done it twice now. Mm. <laughs> Even though I'm, I'm going into my own universe, it's uh, it's very interesting, and I'm excited for uh someone to go dive into that and expound on it more and code veronica deserves a place in uh the history of resident evil and i think it deserves to be in the canon because i think me and steve at one point spoke about whether it should or should not be and i think it deserves to be in there because there's some Mm -hmm. really really uh important uh law points that add positively to the overall story of resident evil Yes, 100%. Um, it's to each their own, but any time I hear anyone kind of calling this a side game, that sort of makes me chuckle to myself because it, it's, it's hugely important. It's it's a game that has gone on to influence the story of many of the sequels. The Veronica virus, you know, shows up many times again. It's 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 mass- massively important in RE6. Um, Code Veronica introduces what is, you know, the beginning of RE5 Wesker as well. Uh, HCF, which is Wesker's little army in this, shows up in Seven as well. So it it's massively important in terms of lore. So that for me, when when people make films and say all eight games, uh, how does that work? Because Code Veronica is is not n- numbered, but it's just as important as any of the others. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, also, uh, we never have realised what HCF stands for, right? HCF. It, it's not mentioned in the game, but um, yeah. I think it. Te- okay. I think it's hive capture force is the is what it stands right. for. It's, it's, I don't know where that comes up, but it's it, it's it's in there somewhere. Um, Adam, what are your final thoughts on Code Veronica? Having now not played it all the way through, but played a good chunk of it finally. Um, you know, I I I get what you just said, Sai, but I can't. And and this is entirely me. I'm not mm-hmm. going to pretend like it's the game. This is me. I can't help but f- think of it as like a side okay. story because I didn't, you know, I I'm not I'm not personally familiar with it. And for me, when when I had found out about the story, it felt like it was really far outside of the realm of what I thought Resident Evil was at the time. Um, and obviously that's changed since then because it's gone on to span the globe in its games. But at the time when I first heard about it, I was like, Antarctica? Sure, yeah. You know, like, what? You, and, and that, again, is it's entirely on me, but I don't think I'll ever be able to shake the feeling that it doesn't personally really belong in in the the narrative that I have for Resident Evil. Okay. Um, but I completely realize that that's on me that's like my feeling um i do enjoy um the game and i enjoy the law uh there are things that that kind of stand out as as being a little weird and i don't know if they ever show up again or not but um there are there are vast parts of this game that feel kind of throwaway to me um and I f- again, I just feel like it's because of my own personal history of the game, not really ever getting into it as much as maybe I should have. Fair enough. Um, and Steve, finally, what's your your last thoughts on Code Veronica? 
A, my younger self is currently trying to wrench free <laughs> and scream, <laughs> shout, f and blind, and curse this game to oblivion. But the young, the, the younger self will be quietened, and you will listen to the elder Steve, who is much wiser. Okay, Her Veronica is flawed. It is not perfect, but it is flawed. Right? We have pacing issues. We have a narrative that is richly written and very, very conceptually great. It is peppered with some truly astounding moments, but it's got some atrocious voice acting. It's got some absolutely stupid moments. It's got perhaps one of the most stunning soundtracks in uh, one of the in, in the Resident Evil pantheon. It very much is valuable to the wider law because of its like you know its reaching scope, the Veronica virus. It reintroduces Wesker. And then there's the Albanoid. <laughs> the ultimate fail. You know, this, 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 like, I love the general concept of this, this game and, and the way that people like it. But I feel like whenever people try and tier list the Resident Evil games, Code Veronica gets stepped up for reasons I cannot truly fathom. It's serviceable in most aspects, but there are a lot of like things that just don't quite work. It's the it's the seventy five percenter. It's the you know if if, ever, if everything else is the perfect ten, this is a seven because all its other bits drag it down. And that's it, it. Feels cruel to say because I feel like but they tried something different. They tried to do this in fully three D. They tried to put all these big budget action sequences in. I, I can't sum up my feelings on Co-Veronica in the same way anymore because it. I can see its wider value, mm. but it still infuriates the living daylights out of me at times. I, I, I'm meandering now, but basically, yeah, it's six out of ten, seven <laughs> out of ten. No, uh, I, I you know. see. I completely see your point, and I think, yeah, I would agree with a lot of that. It is we spent sort of two hours or whatever talking about. Uh, all of its little flaws because it's it's got a lot of them, um, but it does it's it's got a lot to sing praises about. Like we said, the narrative it does, despite some maybe uh, lacking visuals in places, it has a fairly decent atmosphere because of the strength of that soundtrack. Personally, I do like the characters. I like the character interactions, whether that's you know no finally one, getting to Paul see Paul Rodrigo, have they? No, no, no. But that's and a no, nice no, moment. No, no. Yeah, I'd say everyone's talking about how Claire doesn't show much empathy. I think she shows more with Rodrigo than she does with. Which is funny because uh, that's an optional thing, isn't it? I think leaving him. Sorry, so, I didn't mean to jump in. It's no, just, no, that's yeah. fine. You, yeah, you're totally right. Stuff like that. That's a nice moment for Claire, as is you know getting to reunite with Chris on screen. Um, that's that's cool. Um, I like her and Steve. I have to say, uh, I like Alfred and Alexia and the mirroring there of the siblings and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, from a story perspective and a character perspective and stuff like that, I find it particularly strong. I find it very engaging, which is why I can go back and play it. Um, even though, yeah, it's, it's it's a longer one and it's <laughs> man, is it not a, a good, an easy game to get an A rank on? Goodness me, that's uh, the speedrunners of this is just ridiculous. Um, but flawed though it may be, yeah, I, I find myself going back to it. Um, Time and time and again, it's just something about it. Much like Survivor, I think. It's just something about it that um, I'll always cherish, despite its issues. I just like the fact that there's a 3D printer in it. <laughs> it was a new in technology. Yeah. I know, it was so exciting. I was like, holy... <laughs> I mean, they do, it, they do it like in reverse. Like, you have to put a big block of material there, then cuts it out of, but it was exciting. Yes, and on that note, please... Remember to store your metallic items in the security box. I mean, nothing else <laughs> remains for me but to thank our contributors. <laughs> if you'd like to be part of the show, then please look into auditioning for our file readings. One way to get in touch is to email us at fasprayprod at gmail.com. But of course, the best course of action is to join our Discord server where you can discuss Resident Evil with us and other fans and listen to the podcast live as it's being recorded. The link to the server is in the description of this podcast and also on our social media profiles. You can follow us on Twitter at fasprayprod, on Instagram at fa spray pod and on facebook at facebook.com forward slash fa spray pod 
You can find the podcast on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify and iTunes. And if you enjoyed the show, please do leave us an iTunes review if you can. It helps spread the word. You can also support the show at patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod for as little as $1 a month. In our next episode, we close out our second year as a show. Can you believe it? Adam will be hosting a round of game show goodness with Trivia Challenge round two thank you to the panel you can follow all of the pueblo people individually i'm at signiac underscore one two three steve is at fb steve was taken Sherwin is at show into gender adam is at advicar zero one and james is at moist owler off and finally thank you for listening and have a good week Right, okay, well, that is the news out of the way. Um, actually, I say that. There is one more that I didn't write on the headlines. I don't know if we want to go into it, but the uh, the announcement that the Netflix series is going to be a sequel to the video games. Do we want to do we want un- <laughs> un- un- unpack that? Because I don't think I can talk about that. I just love the term that they just said. It's a sequel to the video. I'm like, you do realise what that means. You can't just say it's a sequel to oh, the video games. Oh, it gets games. worse. It's a sequel to all eight video games, was exactly. the phrase that they you said. <laughs> oh, yeah, all eight of them. That's right. <laughs> so, all they mean is it comes after all of the video games. Not as a sequel to it, just... It's just in timeline after. Sounds I don't like care what they word. say. The Wesker kids are not canon. No, <laughs> Doesn't matter how kids. good it is. Uh, that's going to be a Solving problem. their crimes with that little dog. And... <laughs> Licky the liquor. Yeah. <laughs> did, they, did, they pull a similar, the did they pull a similar stunt with the original RE1, uh, the original RE movie, trying to say it was, it was like a side story in the same universe. Yeah, they were very vague about it. That's what they like to do, though. They don't like to tell you what's canon and what's not because they fear that people won't care about (laughs) non-canon. Mate, yeah, okay. that's. It's going to be so weird. It might even be good, but it's just... Mm -hmm. It could be good. I don't even know.